the Fed doesn't want to actually grasp the nettle and tighten financial conditions. We've got them going 50 now in December, 50 in February, and another 25 in March. We think that next year what we're going to see is a Fed that's continuing to tighten. The biggest risk is if they under tighten uh, because they've sent such a strong message about needing to get inflation down. The stagflation problems that we've seen this year, they're not going to go away anytime soon. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Why is your bracket so good? Oh, please. I mean, seriously, how is your bracket that good? Here's the way it is, folks, and we do it from March Madness as well. Kaylee Lines taught me this. She only uh, she only goes with, like, Netherlands and the others. They have orange in their jersey like the Cavaliers. You chose blue. I, a blue. It's a blue theme this year. So you've got a France-Argentina France, final. France-Argentina in the final. That is I, absolutely is very ridiculous. I promise this is going to be a refuge for... English football fans for the next couple of hours. We're just not going to talk about it. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Your equity market positive by about a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. This week, TK, we're told it's all about two things. Well, it's a huge week. Inflation, they're going to get that survey. And then, of course, we have a Fed meeting. Join us for that, folks. We'll be there on Wednesday, I think it is. And, and John, what's important to me is to see if Powell can keep the ball contained in the goal and not put it over the crossbar. And You've got to keep digging, aren't you? Keep caught on that. <laughs> and the answer is I think he's going to be very contained. He's going to be very on message. And because of that, I'm looking far more at the inflation data. Mike Wilson, Morgan Stanley, yesterday's news. He knows how to make a headline over at Morgan Stanley, doesn't he? Mike says in yeah, yesterday's well, yeah. news, the final chapter of this bear market is all about the path of earnings estimates, which he says are far too high. And I, I, I like got on Twitter this weekend. The Zeitgeist was really busy this weekend, folks. And somebody said, you know, he's got to be the number one strategist of the years. And he's not because he's too nice a guy. You, the, what, what the street likes. You, you said you got to be mean. You got to not mean, but you got to go. We believe. We believe. We believe. <laughs> we believe. Lori Calvacina is like Mike Wilson. You know, they have grace and dignity, and he's got humility, and he nailed it this year. Do you know what everyone believes? That we get this dip and then a rip next year. Dip and rip. I keep saying that. We're going to yes. get this downdraft <clears throat> where we retest the lows of last year off the back of weak earnings in the first half, and then, Tom, it's all going to recover, and we're going back to 4K. Yeah. That is the consensus view on the street right now. Let's get this out of the way. I mean, everybody was writing important notes this week, and including outlooks. We'll cover some of them for you, and, and I agree with you on the consensus there. I thought Darda was inspired. Mike Darda. Mike Darda. He and went Ken. through a whole blah, 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 Wisconsin economics and, you know, the whole nominal GDP thing, and then he spent the whole back side of the notes saying that Chairman Powell ought to play top golf. Have you played top golf? I haven't played top golf. I've never golf. played top golf. You go, it's like there's three branches in the Washington area, and Dart is like the f that, That's that fancy drive-in range. Fancy drive-in range. And he said they got to get all on the same page, and you do that over a beverage of your choice at top golf. So you have a beer and you play yeah. golf. Okay, sounds yeah. good. Do you want to try that? You ever played golf? Um, they used to ask me to leave, leave, the, <laughs> leave the field. Let's whip through the price action briefly. Up two tenths of one percent on the S and P. Weaker losses last week on the S and P five hundred. The losses in crude. Let's just sit on that just a moment. WTI is down for a seventh session. WTI is down to the low seventies. Just about holding on to a seventy handle, Tom. It's a big deal on crude. Seventy dollars and forty cents last week on crude. Biggest weekly loss going back to April. We were down 11% on crude. And, Tom, that's even with the China reopening story. Yeah, it is. Edward Morris publishing moments ago with Nathan Sheets over at Citigroup there looks. And he says, look, it's a tectonic shift in the next year. He nailed this lower price outcome. And he looks for, you know, maybe bounce around and all that. But he gets out to sustain commodity weight due to GDP. And the headline from Ed Morris is he goes bullish on gold, which we haven't heard much of. You and I have... Ignored that. The headline on Brent, City cut their 23 Brent forecast by $8 today, down to 80 for next year. So they're coming in again, <clears throat> even for next year. Well, I don't think we got a 69 print, 7048, as you mentioned, on West Texas Intermediate, the American oil. But uh, come on, how many people look for 69 print? I had Morocco, Croatia. Morocco, France is competing with Chairman Powell. Oh, Wednesday. I didn't know that. Yeah, at the same time. Well, we'll have full coverage you for get, you. You get a choice to make. Do you want Morocco, the, France, or do you want a little bit more actually, of Actually, Telemundo decision? is doing the Fed meeting. <laughs> We're going to have two screens, aren't we? We're going to have two screens. Powell's going to come out and they're going to go, no dissent! Telemundo would do a fantastic Fed they special. Would, maybe, we should swap. <laughs> maybe we should swap. Laurie Cavacini joins us now, head of US <clears throat> equity strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Laurie, I just want to start with Mike's words and then we'll get to yours. Mike Wilson says the final chapter to this bear market is all about the path of earnings estimates, which we think are far too high. Laurie, 
Are you on a similar page? Do you agree with that? So I'm on a similar page with Mike, but I don't exactly agree with him. I think it's a little bit more complicated. So we're at 199 for next year. The consensus has been around 230, 231. And I do think that the need to pull those forecasts down is going to create some headwinds, some additional volatility, perhaps a retesting of the low. But does it have to make a new low? I'm not so sure. I think the main issue here is that the buy side wants certainty around multiples so that they can come in and buy and we can have a sustainable rally. All the buy siders know, and they've known since June, that next year's numbers were too high. If you look historically, most of the cuts and down earnings years are in by April. And if you look on a single stock basis, when the rate of revisions to the upside is falling, you watch for it to turn positive again. You watch for that shift from negative <clears throat> revision territory back to positive revision territory. And stocks typically bottom the S&P 500 price three to six months before earnings estimate revisions for single stocks stop going down. What that means is that if we can kind of get all these cuts out of the way by March, it's still reasonable based on the historical playbook for October to be the low. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to turn around, but I don't necessarily think that we have to break to a new low because of this earnings issue. And making a time call, I know it's really, really difficult, Laurie, but what do you suggest people do between now and March? So I think you have to back up and say, what have people already done and where are they? And most defensive sectors are near peak multiples relative to the S&P 500. And people have been loading into staples all year, rotating into healthcare since the summer. I don't think people have enough recovery trades for when we finally do put that final bottom in and start to recover. So we tell people, look at things like financials, look at things like tech. Uh, look at things like small caps. Those are areas that typically outperform when you're coming out of a recession after you've made that final bottom. And small caps, frankly, John, are already starting to outperform. They put in their relative low back in yeah. May. So we think that people really don't need too much more <laughs> defense. And, you know, I wouldn't necessarily dump all your defensive shares right now, but I would start thinking ahead to that recovery right. trade, not just this final turn. Laura, I think of the great Dave, David Triple at Pioneer years ago who had explained to me that small cap and mid cap go once every nine years, once every eight years, whatever the pop is. And I read in your research, you're really looking for that pop to be this year. If we have a great zombie roll up, which frankly we're beginning to percolate and see because money actually costs something, how do small caps react to the fact we now have a risk free rate? We have zombie companies that have to do something. How does that play into your call? So I think you want to be in line with the higher quality small caps, the bigger names, the more liquid names, um, you know, kind of where the typical small and mid cap portfolio manager likes to invest, not kind of the bottom three quintiles of market cap where you get tend to get the dicier balance sheets, you tend to get the lower quality <coughs> names. We actually think there's plenty of valuation appeal in that upper echelon of small cap right now, which is one of the things that makes it so interesting to me because we haven't had that right. for a really long time. Are small caps correlated to the weaker dollar, finally end of strong dollar international play? Do you cross correlate those two categories? I think that the dollar is complicated for small caps. They have been benefiting Agreed. from an earnings perspective by dollar strength. If you look at, if you try to sort of match up the relative cycle with the dollar over time, you're not, you're going to just want to pull your hair out because it, it's not. Consistent. Watch yourself, Lori. But, Be careful. With that <laughs> but but <clears throat> recently they they've been benefiting from an earnings perspective because they don't have those pressures. I think that what I see right now, and you know, I just got off a, a week of being in Europe talking to investors there, they are very, European-based equity investors are very perplexed by the expensive valuations that we have sitting in S&P 500 companies right now. You don't have that same valuation pressure down in small cap right now. So I think when you're, you're right. starting to you know, cross borders, I think you've still got the better valuation story here, and that will be appealing regardless of some of these currents. But are they, gonna, are they going to roll up? I mean, I don't mean the quality small caps. And there's like 3,000, let's say, is a working number. What are the other yeah. 2,700 going to do? Or is there going to be one grand roll up because money finally costs something? I mean, what do you mean by roll up exactly, Tom? Mergers, the transactions, combinations, mergers? Microsoft you know, taking out a teensy weensy bit of the London Stock Exchange today just to get on board, that I, kind of stuff. I I think that you will get that in certain sectors where you have more valuation appeal. I think industrials, even though it's not cheap, is always an area where we see those roll-up stories and the reshoring thesis could further some of that along. But I think ultimately those roll-ups and that M&A cycle, that's really more about what waits us on the other side of this recovery. In a sluggish GDP environment, growth is scarce. And companies, I think, will feel more compelled to go out and buy growth. And you can find that in some of those higher quality small caps, not necessarily the smaller ones, 
But again, it might bring you back to some of those higher quality, you know, more liquid type names. And Laurie, you've touched on something really important here, and that's about leadership in the recovery in the second half of next year. Is it too early to draw conclusions about where that leadership comes from? That's a discussion we're ultimately having right now. Why is the, now the right time to have that conversation? I think it's the right time because, you know, you know as well as I do, John, when these bottoms happen and people are convinced of these bottoms, they, they just sort of take off and you don't have time to get in. You have to do your homework early while things are sort of quiet and churning around. But I'll tell you, last week we did have a lot of discussions about what is the new leadership, typically in a sluggish economic growth backdrop, which I think is the price we pay for a short, shallow recession growth stocks outperform. But is it the old growth or is it the new growth? And that's why I think a sector like industrials is starting to get a bit overvalued. Now, we're just neutral there. We don't like the valuations. But we have been talking to people a lot about how that might be the best long-term growth story in town. And that might be one of the reasons why you're seeing these valuations lift. People basically kind of looking at the old economy and saying what's old might potentially be new again. And that might be where you get sort of the better growth profile going forward. Laurie, this was brilliant. <clears throat> Don't be a stranger. Come back soon. Laurie Cavasina there of RBC Capital Markets, just one of the absolute best. And we just had a 10-minute conversation on the market without talking about the Fed. What do you make of that? I, I think it's good. And Isn't I that think refreshing? it's important. Yeah, Ben Laidler on this this morning in a five-page note. And he says, look, you can do all the Fed navel-gazing. I'm sick of it. You know, we have the Fed show here. And he says it's about markets, and markets will surprise and do better than the economy gloom. On the yeah. Federal Reserve, did you read that piece over the weekend from Craig Torres and Liz Kappa McCormick? So I did Fantastic. Read every word. Over the that's, last that's five really interest rate They're not cycles, even speaking terms, the average hold at a peak rate was 11 months over the last five cycles. 11 months. And this market's price and everyone. Oh, like six weeks, 11 hours? Cuts like a couple of months later after we hit the terminal rate. It's a pretty interesting yeah. debate, isn't it? I think the parlor game. We're going to try to avoid that, folks, not only in the Fed show, but through this important week. When's CPI? Tuesday? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah. Tomorrow. That's, that's you know what we won't avoid? This line from China in the last 24 hours. The top medical advisor in the country saying the risk from Omicron, the same fatality rate as the flu. Now, a lot of people might say the same thing in America, but to hear that from China yeah. is something. It's a big a number. real change. Big, big number. We're going to catch it's up with Ender Curran. A little bit later. Serious. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. A man charged in the 1988 Lockerbie bombing of a Boeing 747 that killed 270 people is in U.S. custody. He's been identified as a former Libyan intelligence officer. The U.S. calls the suspect a third conspirator in the attack, saying that he helped build the bomb that destroyed Pan Am Flight 103 over Scotland. Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz will host a virtual meeting of the Group of Seven leaders today to discuss Ukraine's immediate needs. That's following Russian missile attacks on the country's energy infrastructure. Meanwhile, President Biden spoke to Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky. The White House says the president affirmed the U.S. commitment to keep providing military and economic aid. In the U.K., the government is planning for military staff and civil servants to cover for striking rail, health, postal and other workers. Strikes are planned for almost every day through the rest of the month. Workers are demanding pay hikes that keep up with inflation. It's the biggest wave of industrial strife in the U.K. since the 1980s. The Federal Reserve looks set this week to downshift on interest rate hikes. After four straight 75 basis point moves to curb inflation, the central bank is likely on Wednesday to increase its benchmark rate by a half percentage point. Meanwhile, traders are pricing in Fed rate cuts in the second half of 2023. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. So I believe inflation will be lower. Um, I am very hopeful that the labor market will uh, remain quite healthy uh, so that people can feel good about their finances and their 
personal economic situation. Janet Yellen there, the U.S. Treasury Secretary on 60 Minutes over the weekend. Yeah. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. We'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later. All right. She was sit, ramped sit on that up. Thought. It was right she, after the she, England game. She had game. some things they to say. Right after the English game. You should have heard the language used in my beverages. in my household over the weekend. Yeah. Some select words. Select words. Futures right now up a third of one percent on the S and P five hundred. This week has a real final week of the year feel to it. Yes. CPI tomorrow. Federal Reserve decision coming up on Wednesday. Futures trying to bounce back by a quarter of 1% on the S&P. There is a rally in the bond market. Yields are lower by five basis points to 352.32 on a 10-year. I believe that's about 80 basis points off the peak for the year on a US 10-year. And a lot of people, Tom, lining up to say <clears throat> bye, bye, bye bonds into next year. Yeah, price up yield Constructive. down is the basic theme here. And again, you've got a curve inversion at negative 80 basis points really hasn't done much. So it's a curve that's shifting up and down versus moving around like a yo-yo. We've got Horizon Therapeutics, a takeout there by Amgen. It's a real company, folks. I want to make that clear. These are people with free cash flow, Deerfield, Illinois, out of Dublin. And it's real science. It's immunology is a broad sense. And, you know, we'll have more on this. Is, is 26 billion, TK. Yeah, it's, a real it's, deal. it's like a re, it's like a real you know we're all affected by this Twitter thing. These guys are going to go out for less price to sales, I believe, than what Mr. Musk took Twitter out. And Twitter's a shell of a company compared to uh, this is like real medicine, real finance, and away they go uh, uh, at Horizon Therapeutics, which is what China needs. Except they don't have Horizon Therapeutics. They don't have efficacious medicine. What China has is hope and prayer. And Dekur uh, joins us, and usually on economics, but right now I think we've got to go to the society of all. How long was the weekend and occur in, in Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, and indeed west to Chengdu? Clearly, Tom, events are moving at a very rapid pace right across China. Even through November, there was no hint of a pivot by the government when it came to COVID-0. December has been a totally different story. Yeah. The, messaging out of the messaging out of Beijing now is that, as you mentioned earlier, Omicron is no worse than the seasonal flu. People who have symptoms are being told you can stay at home. Don't be troubling the hospital hotlines. They're dealing with patients who do need care for for example, and that messaging is being rolled out right across the country in a fairly sharp pivot, uh, trickling down to Hong Kong as well. Some changes on the cards here too, some talk of reopening the border with Shenzhen, which, which coming much faster than expected. Goldman Sachs today said all of these changes are coming faster than expected. So all we know right, right now is, all we know right now is it's been a pretty sharp pivot, but I don't think anybody knows where exactly or how exactly this will play out over the next uh, three to six months. And along you're going far away, an amateur like me, we had the great advantage of our people worldwide, folks, and particularly from Johns Hopkins uh, University. We learned that the adults watch the hospitals. Tell us about the hospitals in China. Like, I know there's famous hospitals in Hong Kong and Shanghai and all that, but am I to believe that China is under hospitaled? for the state of this this virus? Well, you know, obviously it has its world-class medical facilities, but a lot of the expert commentary in the build-up to this outbreak was making the point it doesn't have enough of the kind of ICU coverage that, say, the likes of Japan and South Korea have, that that weakness in its hospitals is clearly going to be a concern when you have an outbreak on the scale now that people are talking about, or our colleagues in Beijing are talking about and writing about. Anecdotally, there's obvious disruption going on at the hospitals in Beijing in terms of people turning up looking for admission and <clears throat> either can't get it, can't get it, or uh, don't need to get it. And that was a similar story, by the way, in Hong Kong when they were trying to manage COVID zero while the disease spread as well. So I think no doubt that one of the concerns among China is the low vaccination rate among the elderly. And, of course, whether or not the hospital network can deal with an outbreak on a scale of what's expected over the coming months. When it comes to reopening, Endo, what do you think they believe is the lesson from the West as they've gone through it in the previous two years? Well, it's tough to notice one out, John, because a lot of experts are saying they're going to go through the same kind of exit wave that the West went through, that this is inevitable. Uh, China, some of the official messaging coming out of China are saying actually their vaccination rates vaccination rates are reasonably high. They're making the point that the vaccination rates of their elderly was higher than the vaccination rates of the elderly in Hong Kong, for example. So they're saying they may not have a Hong Kong style uh, hit on the way out of this. But regardless, everyone is keeping a very close eye on how the coming three to six months will go. Nobody's quite sure how it will pan out, whether or not it is a severe public health crisis or if they can navigate it, can mitigate it. Maybe it spreads at different speeds around the country. We're talking about a vast continental-sized economy. But regardless, 
People are wondering now on the other side of it what happens. Already it's clear that China is reopening faster than expected. We know in the interim it's going to be very bumpy and of course public health is number one. But if and when China gets through all of that, economists are talking about maybe a, a faster growing Chinese economy next year than many expected as, as recently as only a few weeks ago. That's what I wanted to get to, Ender. We really underestimated the potential for inflation to build and build quickly in Europe, in the United States as we reopened. What's different about China as it reopens? Why is the potential for that perhaps a little bit lower? Well, again, you get different takes on this, John. There, there's an argument out there that China could actually put a bit of a floor under slowing global inflation next year. Let's say it reopens. You're going to have two stories on domestically in China, for example, this year, they bought the lowest or they imported the lowest amount of oil since 1990. Obviously, that wouldn't happen if China's economy was reopened and humming again. They wouldn't buy more input materials. They would need more commodities, so your iron ores and all of those materials, prices for those would, would go up or at least be kept steady. And then external China, you would have Chinese tourists, Chinese students, Chinese business people all traveling again, looking for airline uh, seats, looking for hotel rooms, looking for real estate. So that's expected to spill over to global trading partners and put a floor under global inflation. So... There are two ways of looking at it. People are saying there's a near-term China economy story, which is going to be pretty bumpy. But if and when China fully reopens and reconnects with the world, a, a humming China economy would probably add some inflation pressures to the rest of the world. Now, and very quickly here, what should we look for this week? I mean, as you said earlier, it's a moving story. Where are we on Friday, into the weekend, and into the holidays? So every day they are taking down some of the defences they had against COVID, either through signalling and messaging or, for example, these health and safety tracking apps that they were using. So keep an eye on what further barriers they continue to take down over coming days, Tom. That will indicate the speed at which they are dismantling this massive COVID zero apparatus that had been built up right around China. And, of course, don't forget we're heading barreling in towards Chinese New Year, which comes early in January this year. And that's going to be a pivotal test for how willing the Chinese authorities are really to live with COVID. The Lunar New Year, just around the corner. And a current, thank you. What a change, and it's happened so, so quickly. And I go back to those comments from China's top medical advisor downplaying, Tom, the fatality of Omicron uh, and comparing it to the, to the flu. But TK, that's a massive shift in a really oh, yeah. short oh, amount yeah. of time from and Chinese authorities. You, well, yeah, Chinese authorities, but is there only one authority, which is, is Mr Xi? I mean, I... I I take the point it's a massive shift, but a shift to what if they don't have the medicine, they don't have a program of vaccination? Maybe they're going to develop a program of vaccination within a totalitarian regime. I That's mean, why I still think it. making a call on Chinese growth next year, Tom, is oh, really, I, really I, I difficult. Wanted, I wanted to go there with Ender. If you get a we'll clean reopening, time. maybe you can make right. a call. But as Ender pointed out, the yeah. debate right now, Tom, is whether we get a repeat of what happened in the West, which is stop, yeah. start and yeah. incredibly lumpy. Thanks for listening this morning. Everyone, they don't care about inflation or the Fed. Where are you going? Where are you um, taking this? Uh, at the University of Cambridge, okay. someone's, you know, they, they slept in at Queen's College. This, this is Mohammed. Talk more He's England. been snowed in. Talk more he wants more World Cup snowed coverage. In. Yeah, it's 20 above zero Fahrenheit. It's snowed in. Okay, yeah. what would you like me to say? I want you to explain, and this came from a sophisticate, Mrs. Keane, why didn't England go down the field more and just attack? I think they did. The initial tactics were spot on. They contained Mbappe. They turned the left side, the French left side, which is a massive strength, into a weakness. Saka, Saka attention, uh, really attacking yeah, yeah. Theo Hernandez. But ultimately, stopped. ultimately, then the substitutions happened. And I think it was the substitutions that I just couldn't make sense of from Gareth Southgate over the weekend. But are we going to keep doing this? Give the UK a break. Maybe. Give England a break, TK. Okay. Coming off the back of the biggest weekly loss on the S&P 500 it's since September, England. going into CPI and the Federal Reserve. You know, that was really mean. That was really cruel. Futures on the S&P <laughs> look like this. <laughs> Positive a third of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, up mm. a third of 1%. We're doing OK as we kick off the trading week. Into the bond market last week, 10-year yield just a little bit higher by 10 <clears> basis points. Likewise, on the two-year, Tom, the whole curve just yeah. shifted up a little bit last week, yeah. and now it's back lower again, right the way through the curve. My Some flattening here. My market to a 19 VIX, even an 18 for a cup of coffee, as we're back to 24.21 as we go into the Fed meeting. 
on Wednesday. Have we had the cathartic no spike? That's what Julian Emanuel of Evercore is talking about. Have we had the yeah. cathartic spike yeah. in the VIX yet? I he like says Julia, no. John Golub, I'd like to know what they think as well. Everybody's got an opinion on this. What I know is there's some tension into Wednesday. You're jumping in with the VIX. Let me finish the bond check. <clears throat> yeah, 10 year, it's 352. Good. Two year, 432. Crude looks like this. Seven day losing streak on WTI. We're down three quarters of 1% on crude. On Brent, we're down three quarters of 1% also. And we are clinging on to a 70 handle. We have just had the worst week, biggest weekly loss since April on WTI crude, Tom. Make sense of that. Makes sense as Ed Morris is, you know, we're talking about Mike Wilson and equities. What Ed Morris did in oil is just shocking. I believe Deutsche Bank was there. Great too. call. Fantastic. Great call. Busy week ahead for markets. You're going to hear that all week. CPI data tomorrow. Later in the week, retail sales, then Eurozone, PMI and CPI, plus nine central bank decisions on tap, including the Federal Reserve, ECB and Bank of England. All of that clearing the path for investors to look ahead to the new year. If you look at uh, you know where we are you know for the U.S. economy of the eurozone economy next year, uh, is there still a chance of recession? Absolutely, right. Um, but probably at best in a, a mild one, uh, both um, in the U.S. and the eurozone. Of course, you know how the uh, war develops is going to calibrate that too. Jeff Yu of BNY Mellon, Tom, looking ahead to next year, and you know the conversation. We're having a conversation about the potential for a recession. And it's just not in the data yet. It's in the market. We can talk about that. But you certainly don't see it in the labor market right now, do you? Yeah, I go segmented here. And a lot of people say I'm wrong here. There's a part of America right now that is in recession. It, but, you know, and you can decile it or take half of America, whatever you want to do. There's a lot of pain out there. While there is a buoyant, employed America are they booming? I don't. I can think Tom, boom is not there. But to it's your good. point, that's good. I think even last year, <clears throat> when the GDP data was so much better, consumer sentiment was pretty soft, given everything we'd seen in the last 12 months with gas prices and inflation. And TK, you've made this point many times. I think we all have around this table. There's a massive difference between how people feel about this recovery yeah. over the last couple <clears throat> of years and what the data tells you. And again, it's what the markets will do, and the economics of it is maybe an underpinning, but they can be separate, and I'm hearing that in a lot of outlooks right now. Let's outlook right now. It's Stiefel with our chief economist, Lindsay Piegs, that joins us at right now. Lindsay, I don't want to get into the silliness of pivot this or pivot that. Where are we right now? What is your real GDP call for this ending Q4? Well, I do think there's enough momentum or ongoing resilience in the consumer that we will see a second quarter of positive activity, <clears throat> albeit markedly below the near 3% pace we saw in the third quarter. But the bigger question is, can we maintain that going into 2023? And I don't see that resilience being able to be maintained as we continue to see some of these variables <clears throat> increasingly weigh on the consumer, yeah. i.e. elevated prices, negative income growth, negative manufacturing activity, a housing market that's <clears throat> right. under extreme pressure. So I, I think that we can argue you can check the recessionary box for nearly every sector of the economy, even at this point, except for the labor market. But even there, we're starting to see cracks. We're starting to see signs of emerging weakness. Right. So while we do maintain that positive uh, trajectory through December, I think 2023 right. is opening the door for a recession. Let's do Algebra Monday, Lindsay. It's Y equals, uh, I don't know what it is, C plus I plus G plus NX is out there somewhere. Can you split your analysis between domestic final sales in real GDP? Can you pair off trade dynamics? Or are they part of getting to a recession? Oh, absolutely. And I think this, this when, when we parse through the trade and inventory data, that's really what complicates the earlier weakness that we saw at the start of the year and why it's likely that we don't see a technical recession in hindsight called for the first six months of 2022. Because when you strip out that volatility from trade and inventories, we see that we actually had positive momentum from December into the first quarter of the year. So this is very much complicating the picture and will continue to complicate the picture going forward. If we look at third quarter GDP, now one of the largest contributors to that top line increase was trade, contributing nearly 3%. But a lot of that was reflective of the weakness on the import side. And that reflects a declining demand or a level of declining demand on the consumer part. Again, highlighting the fact that consumers are on increasingly fragile footing as we turn the calendar page into the next year. Lindsay, there will be some people tuned into this program right now listening to another recession call for 2023 and wondering why on earth the Federal Reserve is hiking interest rates by 50 basis points on Wednesday and probably signaling they're going to do a whole lot more after that. Lindsay, how do you reconcile those two things? 
Well, remember, the Fed is trying to slow the economy. So the fact that we're seeing increasing calls for recession in 2023 means that the Fed's earlier policy initiatives are already having the intended effect of tapping down investment, tapping down consumption, and resulting in a significant slowdown in the economy. Now, the reason the Fed is so focused on continuing to raise rates, not necessarily at the supersized 75 basis point increase that we saw earlier, but 50 basis points, and as you said, more work to come down the road, is because inflation is still elevated. And it at this point, with the labor market still arguably on modest footing, the Fed is hyper-focused on bringing down inflation, reinstating price stability, which the chairman has said time and time again is the bedrock of the economy. So how much more damage do you think another 100 basis points of heightening does? Well, I think it ensures that we do see recessionary conditions, but depending on the behavior of inflation, depending on what we see in terms of international factors, that will determine the depth and duration of the downturn. But again, from the Fed's perspective, it's not about whether or not we see negative activity. It's about whether or not we can get inflation on a meaningful <clears throat> downward trajectory back towards the committee's desired 2% oh, target range. What's your probability of getting back to 2% until England wins in football again, Lindsay? I mean, come on. Where are we getting back to 2%? 25 or is it 26 well, if you look at the Fed's trajectory, they're still very optimistic that we're going to see a two-handle by 20, by the end of 2023, maybe early 2024. But I think the reality of the data suggests that committee members have been calling for this meaningful improvement in inflation for the better part of the past two years, and we simply have not seen that come to fruition. So the Fed, the market <clears throat> continues to right. underappreciate the complicated nature of the inflation equation at this point. And that's why, along with a 50 basis points increase this week, we do expect the Fed to meaningfully revise higher their expectations right. for policy and inflation going forward. Now, this is PX 101. It's service inflation, isn't it? I mean, we're going to get a reversion. And David Malpass at World Bank was great on this years ago. We're going to get a legit goods disinflation, dare I say, true deflation. But services isn't going to get there. What will? You, what do you see as a sustained services inflation above 3%? I think that's absolutely reasonable, but you're right. We are going to see this bifurcation between goods and services, and already we're seeing it in the data outside of inflation. Manufacturing turning back into contractionary territory while we look at the ISM services index, and that is still arguably uh, on solid footing. And so this bifurcation, again, does yeah. highlight the difficult nature that the Fed is going to face in trying to tackle broader inflation pressures, particularly as we see this wage price but, spiral continue to accelerate. Lindsay, you and John are way too young to understand this. We survived this before. If we only come down with services elevated to 5% or 4% or 3.8%, life goes on, right? People adapt, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we will come out of this, but I think the trajectory of how we come out of this depends on the Fed's resolve to reinstate price stability. If they start to get cold feet, if they start to pull back prematurely, then we could see inflation become entrenched in the economy, meaning that we don't see that improvement back to the Fed's 2% target. But if they stay the course, it will be more painful in the near term, but we could see the economy emerge faster and with more uh, gusto as we begin to get back to a potential level after that 2% target is reinstated. Hey, Lindsay, thank you. Lindsay Piexa there of Stiefel. It's on Thank this you. coming, at the same time we're having conversations about maybe shifting the inflation target from two out to three. <clears throat> Alarian talking about it in the FT potentially, pushing back against the idea at the moment. Heard the same no. thing from Bill Dudley, also pushing back against the idea as well. Where did this come from? Was this Adam Posen that started this? No, you shift no, to three, no. you go from it, two. Who Dr. was it? Dr. Posen has been such a supporter of the program. Remember at Jackson Hole? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He came out, he came like, out in shorts and a T-shirt and we were freezing. Or something like 12 <laughs> below zero. Folks, the heritage of this is the courage of Olivier Blanchard and the laureate Joe Stiglitz. I'm going to guess 2009, where they just said, let's frame out 4% inflation. And people went mental. I mean, people went absolutely apoplectic over this 4% number. And it's modeled, and Adam is very clear to say his 3% path is, with nuance, is different than what his colleague, Olivier Blanchard, says you get to 3%. My answer is put a band around it. I mean, 3% may be 2.7% or whatever. How far is that 
from a John Taylor like 2%? My answer is we're splitting the hairs here. The backdrop matters. I think you start questioning the inflation target Anchored. at a time where inflation is too high. I think people start questioning your yeah. credibility to hit even three, never mind two. Tom, isn't it just a time horizon question? Don't you just turn around and push it out? Push it out yeah, well, another I mean, it's, 12 it's months? Like, yes, but it's like when England was on anchor, they put in Sterling. What did Sterling do okay. when he came in? Let's go there. What did Sterling is, do is when Is this he came punishment in? for 10 years of trolling the Red Sox? Is that, is <laughs> that what, is that what this is? There's a lot to troll there. This is? Don't go there. Come on. I'm, I'm moving to San Diego. We mentioned this earlier. <clears throat> for people just tuning in, the big worry was Mbappe. Kyle Walker did a phenomenal job yes. down that side. Yes. Mbappe was almost yes. absolutely contained. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, that was meant to be the strength of France down that left side. Yeah. Theo like Hernandez Isaac. is also really down. quick. The Bobby left back. Down. They turned that side into a weakness. Saka was phenomenal. He was terrorising but, that defence for about Saka 90 minutes. Saka was the best player in the field. But so they, why was he taken off? I don't <laughs> that's, know. that's ultimately the conversation. We're sitting there with a the beverage, like, beverage the of my choice, and I'm like, what? But that's the conversation to, we have. To me, come on. They kicked the ball from farther out. That's about the first goal. Is, was that, like, is that your that's like match day analysis? Football. Yeah, it's my match. You kick the ball. How do you feel about Harry coming back to Spurs? Um, don't you think... How's he going to feel? No one knows. No, I, I think it's, you know... It's a, it's it's a miss a penalty with yeah. the stakes that high. It's a lot of pressure. But, Tom, do you know what? Out of everybody, who would you have picked to take that penalty? That spot kick, you wouldn't have picked you anybody me. else you apart from Harry Kane. Else. You wouldn't have picked okay, so anyone else. This is apart a knowledge base, Kane. folks. I don't have. All I know is Argentina wears a blue jersey and France wears a blue and jersey. And that's why they're so. in the final of your bracket. And that's you why know. you have absolutely wiped mm. the floor with me ben in our Bloomberg bracket. What is it? The 18th is the finals? Next Sunday. Ben this what? Sunday. Yeah, you know. Bistro. You, know. you want to watch it together? You missed the viewing party, Sam. I did miss the viewing I know. party. We'll talk about did that. Did AMH behave herself? Anne Marie turned up. She was mental. Futures up a third of 1%. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In China, COVID is rapidly spreading through households and offices after the country's pandemic rules were eased. Now that's led to turmoil in poorly prepared hospitals. Some facilities are struggling to find enough staff and others are suspending non-COVID treatments. President Biden and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen have reaffirmed U.S. support for Ukraine. CBS, CBS asked Yellen about how long American support can carry on, and she replied, as long as it takes. Meanwhile, President Biden told Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky the U.S. is committed to aiding Ukraine and holding Russia accountable for the war. Scientists in California have made a breakthrough in nuclear fusion technology. Bloomberg's learned that for the first time, they've produced more energy than consumed in a reaction. It took place at the Energy Department's Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory near San Francisco. While the results are considered an achievement, it's still a long way to creating a viable technology. Microsoft has agreed to buy a stake in the London Stock Exchange Group. The move will give the software company a 4% equity holding, which is currently valued at about $2 billion. The stake is part of a long-term agreement to help LSEG develop data analytics and also cloud infrastructure using Microsoft's products. The group will spend a minimum of about $2.8 billion on cloud services over the next 10 years. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. The danger of this war is extraordinary. And, and it can go on for years. But this oil and gas thing, it looks like you know, the Europeans will get through it this winter. Mm -hmm. But this oil and gas problem is going to go on for years. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, if I was a, a, you know, in the government or anywhere else, I'd say I have to prepare for getting much worse. That was Jamie Dimon, the J.P. Morgan CEO on CBS over the weekend from New York City this morning. Good morning. CPI data coming tomorrow morning. Then it's on to a Federal Reserve decision going into all of that. Equities elevated by just a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, up by about a third of 1%. Yields are down. Treasuries are up. 352.14. The whole curve shifting lower. Just a bit of curve flattening in the mix here, Tom. That move lower, led by 10s and led by 30s. I'm going to call it resilient dollar here off the blush. You know, we had a you know strong dollar and we've given it, just it back. Just about. We all know that story. But it's sort of like churned here, I think, waiting for tomorrow's it's been day. a massive turnaround there, Tom, from the end yeah. of September. Yeah. For euro dollar to go up from, what was it, 95? 
you to know, about 105, 106 at the moment. Chanel Bass will know better than me, but is everybody shut down for the year? I mean, certainly after Wednesday. So after Wednesday, I'm, you know, boom, gone. Boom, year over. <laughs> I'm ya. out. I'm out. I'm taking the rest of the year off after that. <laughs> you are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if anyone noticed that yet, but we'll work oh. it out. I'm, I'm are you going to leave at like 2.32 to, or are you going to leave? Last time I did that, then the Bank of England hiked interest rates, didn't they? You've still got the yeah. BOE and the ECB on Thursday. Then mm -hmm. after that, as that. far as the schedule is concerned, we're done. I think a lot of people want to wrap this up and call it a day on 2022. Well, what we'll do is a day afterwards, when we have ECB, Bank of England, we'll break out the Tang Mimosas. Oh, nice. Oh, that sounds special. Uh, we're going to talk about Horizon Therapeutics. It's a really, really interesting story. We'll get to that here in a few uh, moments. Right now, in the story that matters to you, the big shock here of oil coming in, in a breath of fresh air with the concern of refined products, Stephen Short briefs us. His research note with the Short Group and the Short Report is absolutely definitive on dynamics, on valves in pipelines. Stephen Shork, what is our integrity now of our system if we get a cold like Aberdeen, Scotland is getting? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in a lot of dire straits here, uh, it has to be cold as far as the distillate market, Tom, uh, here in the Mid-Atlantic and the New England market areas. The Northeast United States consumes 70% for space heating, uh, home heating oil. Uh, and right, there's still a dearth of product. We, we've had a significant sell-off over the past week, a week and a half in this market. And quite frankly, right. my clients, the heating oil, the, the people on the boots on the ground, people who have to consume, they, they, they buy and they sell and they, they distribute heating oil, they're perplexed by the move lower. They cannot find product. It's very difficult for them to find product, and yet prices are still moving lower. So it is a conundrum for, uh, for some of my home heating oil people here right. in the Northeast. You know, I, I look at Javier Blas with a great chart out this weekend as he writes up his Bloomberg opinion piece on the spike, the surge in English utility costs. Do we get the same surge if we get the same cold? Or are we, are we managed in a way where distillates, core oil, gasoline, diesel, the rest of it, where we don't see a spike like they see in Europe? Uh, we won't see quite the spike that we've seen, but we are, we have, and we will continue to see a, a spike in demand, uh, not only for home heating oil, uh, but of course our electricity costs, our natural gas costs, are, are sky high relative to recent norms. Tom, probably the only market, if you heat with propane, that is the only market here in the low 48 where there is an actually surplus. Uh, of propane. We are swimming in propane, whereas in our other heating BTUs, be it distilled yeah. fuels or natural gas, there, there is there's well, John, virtually no product. And that's a pizza thing. We got to the deck. I mean, is that it's right? like killing us. We're using that six days a week is now, that, propane. That's so how you, you stand warm. Every time, it's, like, you told, it's like a hockey goal. <laughs> you got the kids like eating a, outside we, we with got, propane. We, we got three pieces in there. It's like familia. <laughs> uh, You're absolutely you know. ridiculous. Please. Stephen, can you talk to me about the demand supply backdrop going into next year we've drained a big chunk of the SPR Europe managed yeah. to refill natural gas but only doing so through Nord Stream and they got through most of this year the back end of this year because the cold snap didn't kick in until now Stephen I want to understand the dynamics into next year you heard that warning from Jamie Dimon at JP Morgan can you run us through that well, right now, I, of course, I'm going to agree with Jamie that the long-term structural imbalance between supply and demand globally uh, is not going away. And yes, we have, for the moment, dodged a bullet with regard to the start of winter and the Ukraine war. But we're not addressing the long-term issues of bringing more infrastructure to sate uh, growing demand. The narrative has shifted to a point now where it's moved away from supply, which has been the, the real uh, uh, bullish driver. And now it's a demand picture. I think all the Wall Street banks now are, are, are singing the same chorus about economic contraction in the first half. If we look at the Federal Reserve Bank's favorite recession indicator, the three-month 10-year yield, uh, it has rarely been as bearish as it is currently trading on the inversion right now. So, and then of course we look at the employment numbers. Now the latest job numbers seem to be uh, relatively constructive, but once again, people are not working, especially men in their 20s to 40s are not working. And we're looking at a huge chasm between the household numbers and the establishment numbers. One, one survey of jobs says, yes, jobs are growing. The other one says, no, jobs are contracting. And the one that says jobs are contracting really can, uh, uh, melds with what we're seeing in the tech sector. Tech, the, the, the white collar, the, the haves 
are now starting to see massive layoffs, layoffs they haven't seen since the Great Recession. So there's a lot of minefields to kind of navigate in the first half. It's certainly pointing towards an economic contraction. And therefore, that is really, I think, the overhang on the market right now. We're, we're worried less about supply and more about dwindling demand uh, for the new year. Is that worry about demand misplaced given China's reopening? Can China fill the gap even if we do roll over next year? China can fill absolutely fill the gap, and there is that demand. But but they were giving a nice little gift by the West. They were giving a fantastic negotiating price, saying, "Okay, Russia, you can't sell your oil for more than sixty dollars a barrel." Now, of course, the Indians and the Chinese will continue to buy Russian oil. They will they will buy it above sixty dollar. Uh, I mean, they will negotiate, but they're in a far better negotiating deal. So while this demand will continue to grow uh, as China continues to lower their, their uh, mitigation protocols, uh, yeah. they're still going to be buying oil at a well below market value. Stephen, one final question, really important. How's that electric vehicle thing going? I mean, you follow it tangentially over from your expertise in hydrocarbons, but from where you sit, how's EV doing? Uh, EVs are going to be the biggest drain on the environment that will make 120 years of mining for coal and oil look like a, a like they were members of the Sierra Club here. With the amount of rare earths <laughs> we have to dig up. Now, personally, guys, I drive an electric hybrid. It is a 17-gallon tank. I just drove. I just had to refill my, my car after not filling it for two months, I drove nearly 1,400 miles wow. on a combined electric 17-gallon tank. That's the wave of the future. And so what I'm getting at here is like compromise. We have to work together. Right. It's not a zero-sum oh, game. Them. We are the people. No, no, no. Stephen Short, thank you. Hey, so, Stephen, but John, thank this you. is just down. Thank I stood you. in Detroit at the North American International Auto. The Show. international piece of that is important. And Mercedes said just what Stephen Short said. The certitude each way is baloney. We I caught up with Mercedes on Friday. You missed that. I missed that. We caught up with the CEO. Was, yeah, you know, and they had to drop their prices on that offering in, in China. They had yeah. to drop their prices. Working <clears> out what's going on in China right now when it comes to Tesla the big autos. Tesla in China? Yeah. So I spoke to Ed Ludlow about Tesla in Shanghai oh. and reduced factory hours. And I was trying to work out, is it production line upgrades or demand, one or the other or both? And he said perhaps a little bit more about production <clears> line upgrades than a weaker demand picture. But I guess we'll see. We'll okay. see. Apple have got similar issues over there at the moment on the production side. Can we talk science? By all means. Immunology. Horizon Therapeutics is taken out uh, today by Amgen. This is a legit company with legit size, Deerfield, Illinois, Dublin, and the rest. And what's great about this, for those of you on radio, the academics of this crew is heavyweight. And these are people that went to all sorts of schools like Muhlenberg in Pennsylvania, Franklin and Marshall, and the fabulous Harvey Mudd out on the West Coast. And then got lots of graduate degrees and ramped it up first in science. And the best thing about this is the leader, Tim Wahlberg, was actually a patient. He was grievously ill in immunology years ago. That's amazing. That's how we got into it. It's a great story. It's you know I, I don't think there's enough said about this about these biotech companies. They got prodigious academic chops, and then to do the financials that they've got with Andy Pasternak it came from Bain and Company, and and you know they put it together. And boom, you know today's twenty six billion dollar deal. 20 percent premium. Muhlenberg is going D one hockey. That's what it means. I can just see you know. Were you D1 hockey? No, I was not D1 hockey at the time. I what was division were you? Division 5. Division 5? <clears throat> yeah. Was that because you wanted to go to a party school? <laughs> no. Is that, that, is that what that no, was about? Although there was the time where the rink was sold out and the streakers went by. And oh. the next, I was on ice. Okay. I'm on ice and the right. place goes mental and I think there's a fight. Mm. And it's three guys going naked around the top going, go Tigers. And they run. They made the national news the next night. That's that kind of hockey. Do you, do you want to share what year this was? This was <laughs> years ago. Yeah, the Zamboni you pulled. <laughs> the Fed doesn't want to actually grasp the nettle and tighten financial conditions. We've got them going 50 now in December, 50 in February, and another 25 in March. We think that next year what we're going to see is a Fed that's continuing to tighten. The biggest risk is if they under-tighten, uh, because they've sent such a strong message about 
needing to get inflation down. The stagflation problems that we've seen this year, they're not going to go away anytime soon. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. This was supposed to be a World Cup free zone for the duration no, of the program. It's been a success. But you are refusing to drop it. No, I, I want to like hang out like they do in Qatar, you know, no tie on, and they got the shoes with the white soles. And Have you noticed cool. that? I'm not into that. Yeah, I the agree. sports presenter with the suit and the yeah, and the know, sneakers. Yeah, oh, you know, I don't, I've got no time for that. I'm having fun with it. From New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning to you all. Equity futures are just about positive on the S&P 500. We've got a big week coming up. We've got yes. CPI coming up tomorrow. The Federal Reserve decides on Wednesday. Bank of England Thursday alongside the ECB. What more do you want? What you want is clarity, and we got that from Lindsay Piegs at, at Stiefel. I thought she was great on this, 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 this parsing of goods inflation back to a disinflationary trend of some form. But services inflation, and that is the mystery in the next year, what does service, 70% infl- of the economy, what does service inflation do she has it like a lot of people sustain and service x shelter we're going to be talking a lot about oh, that might be on yeah. wednesday i'm sure there's you're also service x england but that's a different we're story. not going to talk about that okay, do you want to no. talk about the dot plot you love that as much as i oh, love this england hey, talk hey, this do morning. we have a dot plot on wednesday we'll have a dot plot oh on i did not know that the tk the essence of the decision comes down to the dot plot and how oh, far no, that dot in 2023 total comes up garbage i'm with richard Burner you're pushing back stage. against that i i have told mike mckee i think so when this just... market trades on projections from the federal reserve what are you going to say on wednesday i'm going to say it's euclidean garbage how about that garbage well it's france france is going to win so it's garbage you know and then what? You just you're not going to listen to whatever the Fed thinks is going to happen no, next year. No, I will you don't listen think to Chairman Powell. I think I think it will be a very very good uh, press conference. I believe Vice Chairman Clarida will be with us, which is yes, I've you heard know, that. Really yeah. and, and Mr. Dudley coming out the other side of the news. Oh, we did, I didn't know that. Okay, the, you know that's a I show. I think that's folks, been confirmed. Like I mean, I don't know if Bill knows that yet, but I'm <laughs> oh, sure God. it's been confirmed. <laughs> Let's get to the price action briefly. <laughs> As we keep saying, keep telling you, massive week. I think defining week coming up for the next couple of months at least, with inflation on deck tomorrow. Then. Federal Reserve decision. For those of you that do follow the dot plot, it is about the 2023 dot and how far that's going to come up. Chairman Powell has been leading us to believe that will bump higher at the next meeting. Equity futures right now up a quarter of 1%. The whole curve shifting lower. Two's out to 30. It's just a little bit of flattening for you. We're down about five basis points on a 10-year. 352.51. Euro dollar not doing much at 105.66. Crude doing a lot over the last seven days. Down for a seventh consecutive session on WTI crude. Tom, we're just about holding on to 70. We've just had the biggest weekly loss on WTI since April, and we're doing this as China continues to make an effort to reopen. And we're going to talk about this later. The top medical advisor in China, China's top medical advisor comparing Omicron to the flu. Now, that is a massive change from, what, a month ago? Oh, two weeks ago. A few weeks and, ago. And, and I would time it to the party Congress and that they've got the political knitting out of the way. So now finally they can take anti-science and try to nudge it towards the 19th You've century. You've called it anti-science. Oh, I do. I, I think that, you know, you know, we're just we're making, not jokes, but we're showing the acclaim of Horizon Therapeutics and what they're doing with Amgen. These guys are the anti-science that everything at Horizon Therapeutics is science I hate in you. immunology. Joining us around the studio table, <clears throat> I'm pleased to say, is Michael Shaw, CEO of Mark. Market field asset management, like Michael. This is great. We're not going to talk about England. Let's don't do worry. that. I don't know. I don't know. Let's I don't know. Economics, what TK finance, investment. East yes. trouble this morning. Let's talk yes. about markets. The consensus view next year is recession. The consensus view next year is that we get this dip in the first half off, fear of bad earnings and bad earnings materialising, and then it's something you want to buy into year end, and we end up something close to where we are right now. What do you make of that cute little story for 2023? I mean, it sounds a little bit easy. Um, you know, I, I do think bear markets end. So at some point, this market will sure. bottom and, and, and will go up again. But I, I think the thing you've got to remember is we are still in a bear market, a bear market that I don't think completed its business back in October. Um, and you've got to concentrate on, you know, I, I think surviving the difficult <coughs> start to next year. We, we can worry after that as to whether or not, you know, late 2023 looks like a great place to be and we're back at 4,000 or. or whether you're still, you know, dealing with, you know, with this mess. But, um, you know, I think this is a bear market rally, which has run its course. Um, I think the, the corporate projections when the earnings come in in, in January are going to be really quite conservative. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the odds of some form of panic are reasonably high. When you look at the character of a low, mm-hmm. what does it tell you that makes you think it's not the low when you look back to October? 
Um, you know, really, I, I don't think the narrative had really changed. I, I, I still think that the people still think of the S&P 500 as the place to be. They, they still kind of want <coughs> to own the same things they owned, uh, you know, a year ago. People are, you know, haven't really given up on, on technology leadership. They talk as if they have. But, you know, I don't think allocations have, have, have really changed yet. Um, and, uh, you know, the lows I have seen or, or read about, you know, they're a little bit more desperate than what we saw in October. October was what I would call short-term panic. But everybody was still grasping for the opportunity to get back in. You have been a student of the income statement. I want to go to my great mentor, Megden Desai of the London School of Economics. And Lord Desai would say it's all about profit. You parse XPX versus the challenges of NDX forward. Is the NDX going to be challenged just because the profitless, the game's over? I think the danger in the NDX <clears throat> is that the profitable part isn't as profitable. And you had these incredible corporate margins in, in mega cap tech. They've just been, you know, literally licenses to print money and have been given the kind of valuations that you only see in great bull markets. I, you know, I, I think that their profits are going to be less certain in 2023, and 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 that's where the worry is. Profitless tech, you know, it's down 80%. It's it's got fairly small market cap now, and it's not somewhere that I want to be. But that's not what pulls the NDX down. It, it it'll be the big guys that pulls the NDX down. Do they get revenues come in, or is it down the income statement where it is about margins? I think it'll be hard to maintain margins in certain cases. You look at somebody like like Amazon is going to be a sort of margin story. But I you know I, I think top line revenue growth projections are going to be a little bit wobbly next year. Something you've talked about that I haven't heard many other people talk about is the potential for a lost decade in parts of this equity market. Yep. And when you talk about the lack of capitulation you've seen when it comes to people who just want to buy growth every time we get a growth dip, can you walk us through why you think there is real potential here for a lost decade in some of these growth equities that dominated a bull market of the last uh, 10 years? I mean, a lot of the story is simply the overcompensation that you had post, I'm going to say, 2017 when it, when when. You know, a lot of this kind of move was um, was multiple expansion. Uh, you know, on, on the Bloomberg terminal, there's a there's a function GE, which literally shows you P, you know PEs. And what we used to joke around with is GE GE back in the, in the late 1990s. And what you could see was that all of GE's price progression was multiple expansion. Their earnings were actually fairly steady. Now, tech wasn't as egregious as that. You you had genuine growth of earnings in in the large cap technology companies, but you had a big expansion of multiples. Um, you did, you know, I think, you know, in many cases, they've overgrown. They've grown to the point that, that it's just, you know, extremely difficult to project forward another five years and see the sort of growth that you had 2018, 2022. Um, and it's just kind of how markets work, is that, is that you, you know, indexes have, you know, wonderful periods of time. And it's been really a wonderful period of time in the S&P since 2008. Um, and then the index constitution sort of just becomes where you don't want to be. And it takes, doesn't take five years to fix that. It, you know, it takes about a decade, sometimes 15 years. Well, we thought we had the cheat code, didn't we? It was passive investing. Yes. You just bought the index. Yes. You ignored everything and you held on to the index. Are you saying that there's a real challenge now to passive investing just at the index level for the S&P? Just yeah, to buy ab SPX absolutely. And, and sleep I, I, don't, well I don't think, you know, I don't think SPX is going to be the place to be. There may be another form of passive investing. Right? Sure. Maybe it's equal weight. Maybe it's global. You know, if, if, you know, people bought EEM in 2002 and sat on it for a decade and that's all you had to do. Um, so I, I still think a form of passive investing will survive. But the S&P 500, that's unlikely to be the place to be. I look, Michael, at, and, and Matt, be sure this gets up here. This GE function is outstanding that Michael Scholl uses. For those of you on the terminal, to take AAPL equity GE Go is the way you can uh, pretend you, you find your inner Michael Scholl, I guess I should say. You have a paragraph on what the buzz is right now, and it is into spring of next year, and that is a collapse of commercial real estate. Uh, one of the one of the great services has commercial real estate down 13 percent nationwide, and you're saying there's some real liquidity commercial real estate issues here. Discuss that. You know, I, I think there's a real problem <clears throat> the way commercial real estate prices. It's nobody's fault, but there's no public market for commercial real estate, and therefore price discovery doesn't really exist. So, you know, what you've seen in commercial real estate, particularly over the last six months, is just transactional volume has has ground to a halt. The deals which had been done were largely negotiated before interest rate projections changed. And yet, in, in all of these large funds which exist, nothing actually marks to market. So, I, you know, I think that the NAVs 
in 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 an awful lot of investable product are largely mythical. You, you, it's not that the buildings have collapsed in value; they're, they're still in theory worth what they were worth. But good luck getting somebody to actually buy it for that. It's not going to happen. So here's the question I've got when it comes to private markets: Does that introduce a new layer of risk next year for public markets? Do you see the bleed through from <coughs> one question. to the other? Yes, there is, there is a bleed through because people own both, and and so what happens when they start to panic about the value of their private portfolio is they start to de-risk in their public portfolio, and and so there is there is an obvious link. I think the link is perhaps more obvious in credit markets than in than in the direct link in equity markets, but I think if we if there is a sort of credit story to this Fed tightening it's likely to spill over from private credit. It's likely to spill over from either commercial real estate or venture capital lending. But, but those, those really were the two areas of excess where the banks pulled back and the non-bank lenders you know, really went to party. It's just hard to believe, Tom, that the price to pay to blow up 10 years of central banking easing is 15 20% on the S&P. I've mentioned that a few times. It's, <clears> it's, I find that difficult to get my head around. When we write a chapter of this, in the economic history books and we say yes we had 10 years of of easy money zero rates and right. massive balance sheets and we tried to unwind it and the price we paid was 20 percent on the s and I, I i struggle with that i really do i struggle with that well it's a regime shift and to me the, um, the, as you mentioned it john and i think it, it i think everybody watching and listening knows this that we believe it is about money i call it a dire straits economy that's what we had for three years money for nothing it's over mark knuffler was awesome you, wasn't you it? see it every every micro thing where does well. knuffler rank for you in in guitarist all time oh knuffler's huge like right i had the there, honor top, top of five a night with him at the bluebird cafe in nashville total class act top five all time no the top ten you know i don't okay. know he had a style he is a stylistic guy and he's a hell of a nice guy Michael Shaw of Marketfield. This was awesome. He's Thank a hell you. of a nice guy. Futures on the S&P, up a third of 1%. Argentina? This really? is Bloomberg. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with The First Word, I'm Lisa Mateo. A man charged in the 1988 Lockerbie bombing of a Boeing 747 that killed 270 people is in U.S. custody. He's been identified as a former Libyan intelligence officer. The U.S. calls a suspect a third conspirator in the attack, saying he helped build the bomb that destroyed Pan Am Flight 103 over Scotland. Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz will hold a virtual meeting of the group of seven leaders today to discuss Ukraine's immediate needs. That's following Russian missile attacks on the country's energy infrastructure. Meanwhile, President Biden spoke to Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky. White House says the president affirmed the U.S. commitment to keep providing military and economic aid. In the UK, the government is planning for military staff and civil servants to cover for striking rail, health, postal and other workers. Strikes are planned for almost every day through the rest of the month. Workers are demanding pay hikes that keep up with inflation. It's the biggest wave of industrial strife in the UK since the 1980s. It's Amgen's biggest acquisition ever. The biotech giant has agreed to buy Horizon Therapeutics for $27.8 billion. Now that represents a 48% premium since a developer of autoimmune disease treatments disclosed it was in talks with three potential buyers. Both Sanofi and a Johnson & Johnson unit dropped out of the running. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. I think I said they're f people, and I wanted people that worked for me to take seriously the harm and misery that was being experienced by all too many Americans. It is not just the data point, it's the people behind them. That was Secretary Yellen on 60 Minutes over the weekend, dropping the F-bomb there, TK. Over the weekend, what do you oh, make of Janet it. Yellen unleashed? I, Colbert, she was great. She's been unleashed academically. For, Sixty minutes for thir for thir over the weekend, years. great. But Tom, this is coming all after we thought. We thought at this point of the year that maybe Janet Yellen was leaving the administration. 
And that no. seemingly is not what's happening. I mean, she's young compared to the president, Washington. that's for sure. What I would say, John, is it, let's review why she's acclaimed in the modern era, and it is this word slack. And as a massive, massive conundrum for the American economy is a level of slack of Americans not participating in our modern technology economy. You she's see the rumor completely... about, about Moynihan? Yeah. You see that rumor? No. The reporting? I think it was from Fox, he actually. In France? No, that Moynihan no. was in the mix to be the next Treasury Secretary. Well, yeah, that, you know, that report okay. doing the rounds in the last couple of days, which is which is odd. Yes, I, I would. You know, but we used but to talk about Lawrence Jamie Fink. Diamond being in yeah, the Yeah, Lawrence Yeah, Fink we've done it, done this a few times. You know, that rumor, John that Farrell. target seems to make. I don't think anyone wants that. That target seems to <clears> shift <throat> around Wall yeah. Street now and again, doesn't it? But then the politics runs into: Do we want somebody from Manhattan to be, you know, running the ship? And that runs into. Let's do this. It's too important right now. Emery Horton surviving a weekend. And she understands that in the heat of the America's Cup, as you look at Washington and all, you need to take phrases from the America's Cup. And so what we're going to say is right now we press on and we pull back with Anne-Marie uh, right now. Uh, after the, is Washington riveted by the, the World Cup, Anne-Marie? Some are. I think, you know, it's across America whether or not you grew up either following soccer or football for John yeah. and whether you enjoy it. I mean, I personally obviously love the World Cup. It's unfortunate for me that it's every four years, but at right. least we have UEFA and other competitions yeah. to look forward to. But I think people were more into it when America yeah. was winning. But yeah. now, yeah, 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 I mean, who do they yeah. decide? Who do they France. choose? Um, Amory, let's go to John Denver right now, almost uh, cinema, West Virginia. I mean, Joe Manchin doesn't watch soccer. We know that. But is he the next to fall in the cinema independent sweepstakes? I mean, to me, that would be a shock to see Joe Manchin do a cinema because he needs to get reelected. There was tons of questions about this over the course of the past year. Of course, when he was negotiating with the White House on Build Back Better, with, which later basically became the smaller version of that for the Inflation Reduction Act. And so far from him and his team, it's that he has no plans to register as a Republican or an independent. Greg Vallier, actually, Tom, talked about this today. And the quote was, I have it up right here, could Joe Manchin consider a switch? That potentially would scramble the Senate math. But we're hearing that Manchin has no interest in leaving the Democrats even though, as you say, Tom, he does face uh, a really right. important and critical and potentially difficult re-election well, on, on the next Senate for him. And the difficult 17 days in the calendar year, give us an update on Mr. McCarthy of California. I mean, I mean, he's the other point of tension, I would say, into the holiday season. Well, of course, we were waiting for the Republicans to then anoint him, right, the House Speaker. Uh, the biggest story right now on the Hill, of course, is spending of the next government. And right now they have till the end of Friday this week to do so. Uh, the Democrats were supposed to come out with their spending bill today. The Republicans had said, if you do that, we will not be signing up for that. But what we are hearing is that over the weekend, they have made some progress. They're about $26, 27000000000 billion apart. It sounds like a lot. But when you're talking about $1.7, $1.8 trillion of yeah. funding, it's really not. What will likely happen is that they'll at least kick the can down the road, and they're going to extend it uh, not so unlucky for all the journalists and politicians on the Hill till December 23rd. And we'll see whether or not they are able to get a full year of funding or then it just gets kicked into the new year. And Marie, what a moment with the Treasury Secretary on 60 Minutes with Nora O'Donnell, looking back to her time at the San Francisco Fed back in 2009 mm -hmm. and reminded of the words she used to remind her staff that real people are going through real issues. MH, I'm, I'm hesitant to use this word rehabilitation, but I'm going to use it because there was a belief that by the end of this year, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen would no longer be Treasury Secretary, that she'd be on her way out. And it just feels like going through the media over the last couple of weeks. It feels like the rehabilitation of, of Janet Yellen. Can you walk us through what's going on here? Yeah, she sat down for a lot of interviews, and it's not just, you know, the name brand networks like 60 Minutes for an in-depth. She also sat down with Stephen Colbert, right? She's coming more into, I, I would say, American households. She, she also just had this really important moment for her where she signed the first, first female Treasury Secretary to sign our dollar bills. So there's been these exciting times for her, and she says that she has no plans on leaving, and she's getting out there talking to the press a lot. So it does seem that that is true, even though there was lots of rumors sparking that she could potentially be uh, saying goodbye to that post following the midterm elections. Of course, the midterms where the Democrats 
didn't do as bad and actually did much better in the Senate than many were expecting. If you go back, though, to that report on Friday from Fox Business, uh, the na newest name that was potentially going to take on that post was Brian Moynihan. He also has refuted that, saying that he has the best job in the world. Well, Gina Raimondo is another name for, I think, the best part of the last 12 months, Anne Marie, yeah. that was thrown around too, wasn't it? <clears throat> Yeah, Gina Raimondo was definitely thrown around. Commerce Secretary, she's been this key critical voice on really uh, integrating the private sector with the government, with the White House, explaining a lot of what the U.S. administration, the Biden administration is doing when it comes to things like, say, chips and how you trade with China. Also, she's been really at the forefront in bringing manufacturing back to the United States, really touting that CHIPS Act and the money this could mean and the subsidies oh. this could mean for companies if they make these chips in the United States. So she was also touted, and there are many that would like to see her potentially take that next step. But no one seems to be pushing yeah. Janet Yellen out for I mean, it. Jo I'm glad you guys bring this up because, John, I really haven't thought about it. Do we have a house cleaning, a constructive house that's, cleaning that's by the That's what I'm thinking about. You know, in the in UK, January. that phrase we use, that cabinet reshuffle. We'd always oh. get that per periodic cabinet reshuffle. And Marie, we asked Brian Deese about it. I, I think he was a little <laughs> bit evasive. Is it fair to say he was a little bit evasive yes, in our conversation last week? And Marie, where is that reshuffle of this administration? Are we looking for one? We definitely are looking for one. I mean, there's rumors about Brian Deese. You guys asked him pretty directly, and he did not want to answer. Um, you know, these are awkward moments for these individuals when they're deciding what to do next. And then, of course, there was that Axios report that, you know, potentially Ron Klain would also be one that's looking to go, especially given where the president is. It would be a time for him to leave the president in good shape. Foreign policy, they were able to continue this united front with the West against Russia. You have falling gas prices. This is something Ron Klain has been obviously obsessed with. And, of course, the midterm election. There was no red wave. So potentially this is his moment to leave. You know, you say you should leave your job at, at the peak sure. status of you at your job. This could be that moment for him. But with Biden, he really likes to keep his staff with him. So it's very difficult for people to leave the quote-unquote Biden family. And these jobs are exhausting. As yes. well, which is why you expect yes. people like Ron Klain to make a move. Anne Marie, can you tell Tom never to miss a World Cup viewing party at my house ever again? Ever again. Yeah. It okay. was so much fun. And you really get an insight of what kind of soccer dad John is going to be. Yes. That one's going to be. It'll be it's going to be pretty intense. We're, pl we're on planning on that. That's actually scheduled in. Press, right? press. Four years. Uh, uh, there was some. Press you know, on, lads. There was some real lads. cursing going on in that you, room. You mentioned image. Thank you. You mentioned you, you reshuffle. Make, make, never mind that f bomb from Janet Yellen. Yeah. I mean the amount of f bombs at my place on Saturday. Is there going to be a Gareth reshuffle? I mean, I read his biography and he missed Southgate. a penalty shot. He missed a penalty shot in '96, 25 years ago, or or whatever. But isn't he a success? I mean, based on recent World Cup history, what are we talking about here? A semi-final, last time around a quarter-final, and getting really, really close to getting past France. And you'd have yeah. to think that would open up the path to get to the final this time around. A final at the European Championships, they lost to Italy on a penalty shootout. For North Macedonia. Uh, TK, I mean, <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of people that would like to see Gareth Southgate stay with a team, but yeah. whether he does remains to be seen. Yeah, we'll have team coverage from London on that news. Is that what you're trying to make January, happen? January, yes. Is that what you're trying to make happen? A snowy, snowy UK, I'm told today. It so is. stay Frigid. warm, stay safe. Flank hassle. Futures up a quarter of 1% on the S&P. This is Bloomberg. Wilson and Morgan Stanley this morning, just absolutely brilliant. We're all focused on CPI and the Federal Reserve this week. He calls it yesterday's news. Yep. Says the final chapter to this bear market is all about the path of earnings mm. estimates, which are far too high in the opinion of the team over at Morgan Stanley. Let's get you some price action. Your equity market looks like this on the S&P 500, up two tenths of 1%, up a quarter of 1% also on the Nasdaq, slightly firmer, going into a massive week ahead. In the bond market, two tens and 30, trying to erase some of the move from last week, I guess. The two year last week up seven basis points, the 10 year up around 10 basis points. This morning in the bond market, two tens and 30, shaping up as follows. Yields down by about four basis points on a 10 year, 353.60 on a 30 year, down, let's call it five basis points, 351. Down just one on a two year, 433. So you've got some curve flattening in the mix. Mm -hmm. And just to round things out on crude, just want to sit on oil. Longest losing streak on WTI potentially since August 2021. We are down for a seventh 
session, <clears throat> Tom. We're nudging lower by four it, tenths of one percent. It's a way we're down. It's, it's just a persistent it's just a, it's just this grind down lower and lower. And yeah, and I'll let I'll let adults tell me where we're going to end up here. But to see a sixty nine handle on West Texas Intermediate is important, John. I think we got to reframe tomorrow's festivities. And what you need to know, folks, is we all talk, and I do this as well, year over year. The adults are talking month over month, and it's easy for you. The Bloomberg survey is both month over month. CPI zero point three percent, teensy weensy thirty day move. And then also core inflation, the same statistic, zero point. Can we get a point two on core just to get that kind of deceleration? No, those month little over tweaks month. there, and then with it you. goes into the year over year. But just to frame that out, to me, you know, we're going to do Fed decision. Fed decision. The inflation decision. Inflation yeah. tomorrow morning, yes. 8.30 Eastern time. The Federal Reserve decision, <clears throat> then on to Wednesday at 2 p.m. We've mentioned this a few times. The Fed, just one of nine central bank announcements coming this week. Ahead of that decision, investors weighing in on what to expect from the central bank. The Fed doesn't want to, uh, doesn't want to actually grasp the nettle. And, um, and tighten financial conditions to the extent that would be ne necessary to really kind of guarantee that recession coming through. This is the conversation right now, TK. Will he lean against the easing of financial conditions that we've seen in the last couple of months? City, Andrew Hollenhorst publishing just moments ago, they say the following, we see a hawkish risk to Wednesday's meeting despite the slowdown to a 50 basis point rate hike pace. Looser financial conditions are right. unlikely to sit well with a committee that is likely now more concerned with persistent inflation driven by a rise in labor costs. Holland Horse and the team at City yeah. Tom just moments ago. We're jargon free here. Freer. Yeah. And Farrell, for you, you're like it's in English, but for us, we're like, what? what did Grasp you say? the nettle. Grasp the nettle. P to property of a plant to inject toxins into the skin of any person. So is Powell going to grasp the nettle did you not and have, did you inject not have, a toxin? You don't, you don't have nettles? You must have nettles here. Did you not call them nettles? Yeah, I, Those I, like I, spiky, I, spiky know, bushes? I don't know. Yeah, I go to Central Park once a year. What you do don't, I know? Like, grasp the nettle? You don't have that phrase here? No, well, sort of, but no, it's foreign. Ah, okay. It's foreign. Well, I'm here to yeah. translate. Whatever you well, you're doing that every day because we're grasping uh, the, the, the nettle uh, as well. What I look at, John, is seriously into grass and nettle, and you mentioned it, is the dot plots. Are they actually going to move the dialogue, the dot plots? I'm not so sure. So they moved the dot plot at the September meeting in the latest projections. <clears throat> every time we've heard from Chairman Powell, he has indicated that the 23 dot will go higher. Now, Tom, how much higher, I think, is the conversation we've ultimately Mm -hmm. Got to have. Does it have a five handle for 23? Uh, yeah. Okay. And is that a hawkish surprise if everyone's expecting it anyway going into Wednesday's meeting? Are you killing me? I, I don't I don't know. I, there's many dots. There's like what, eight, nine, ten dots, and I guess one <laughs> dot that matters. And what I know is Deborah Cunningham with a long term maturity of 27 days really doesn't care about the dots. She joins us right now from Federated Hermes. Um, I got to ask you about this because it's major, major in the news in New York City. Deborah Cunningham. Your world of visible, publicly traded short-term money is somehow linked to any potential blow-up in commercial real estate. What should our viewers and listeners look for in the short-term paper world that begins to show tensions within commercial real estate next year? Well, first of all, let me say good morning to everyone and tell Jonathan, I do know what stinging nettles are. I grew up in very rural <coughs> central Pennsylvania and I understand the term and I've had it on, I've there done it go. before. I grabbed the nettle and it's painful. It uh, doesn't last very long though. Um, so so going back to uh, the, the, the commercial paper market and how that might be um, linked to commercial real estate. Really, from a standpoint of asset-backed commercial paper, that's probably the clearest linkage. Yeah. And what you might see backing asset-backed commercial paper are a number of different types of, of assets. They're usually very short-term, quick turnover types of assets. They're credit card receivables, they're trade receivables, but there are some commercial real estate receivables, very small mm -hmm. amount in asset-backed commercial paper, depending on what program you're looking at. And if you start to see liquidity dry up a little bit on that paper, if you start to see some sort of spreads widening, which we have not seen even right. a, you know, a small amount of, that's probably the sector and that and, and the banking sector. The banking sector, obviously, with their real estate commercial 
um, commercial real estate portfolios also has exposure there. We have not right. seen that yet. This is wonderful. Uh, very importantly, Deborah, can you count it? Is it is it a shadow banking system or a shadow asset back system, or is it very countable and observable to the industry? It's very countable and observable. I mean, obviously, bank portfolios are fairly transparent at this point. We get a good look into the portfolios and the loans on banks' balance sheets. And I might note that when you look at the banking sector today compared to the 2008 banking sector, the balance sheets look a whole lot healthier, a lot more reserves, a lot more um, not, you know, a lot fewer non-performers and, and better asset quality. On the asset back side, there are what are called monthly transmission reports that basically have the same data comparing the loan right. portfolio with that back that paper, similar to what a bank would be. So it is transparent, but you have to go out and look for it. So going out to distant maturities like two years or beyond, how do you deal day to day and adapt to the massive curve, curve inversion on 15 spreads that are the convention of your world? I mean, is this curve inversion like 78, 79, 81, 82, or is it different this time? You know, I think coming from a zero base makes it a little bit different. Um, we've operated for, you know, most of the last 14 years in a zero rate environment. And I think to a large degree, what was what has built up from an inflationary perspective, um, what has built up from a b business cycle perspective is a little bit different than anything that we've had in the past. So I do think there will be, um, you know, we're expecting either slow growth or a mild recession, but in either case, I think the, the important part that is distinctively different in this business cycle and why it may look different from, you know, a curve inversion in a bond market yield perspective is coming from the base of zero makes it different. Deborah, coming into Wednesday, where do you think there is scope for surprise? I think perhaps you're going to continue to see the Fed voters and the dots themselves. You were talking about it before I came on, the segment before I came on. Um, I think you're going to continue to see that go higher. So, you know, I think the higher sooner and for longer just is missing the sooner right now. I still think the Fed is very much on a, a on a, you know, glide path that is higher for longer. So I think you're going to see that terminal rate and that central central rate go, you know, increase. And I think the time frame for which it remains at that higher level will be a longer, longer time frame. Well, longer will come down to the data and we can talk about that time frame yeah. now. As for the peak, I think Goldman's got it at five to five twenty five. I think others have been in the same kind of ballpark. When it comes to longer, Deborah, I won't ask you to guess where the data comes in. I want you to help us understand how you think this Fed will respond to that incoming information. How high is the hurdle for the Federal Reserve to cut interest rates at the back end of next year? How bad would the data need to be? Well, I think you really have to see inflation. Yeah, inflation is the, is, is the key. So, you know, we've seen it go from 1098, depending upon what you know measure you're looking at, down to, let's call it 876. Um, and, and so you've got two percentage points from an annualized perspective taken out of the system with, you know, 300 plus basis points in, in uh, increased rates in that time frame. Now, we're, we're on a path toward that end, so it should take less uh, increasing rates to get another 200 basis points and then another beyond that. But getting down to 2%, I think is pretty difficult. I don't think you get there quickly. And I think the Fed will have to look at the data and sacrifice to some degree um, the inflationary side of it going, maybe they get to three or 4%, but I don't think they want to, you know, sink the country into a more severe recession. And as such, I think that, that they, you know, will likely have, a time frame when they have to, you know, sort of weigh the differences between am I going to have inflation and either 1% lower, but a recession that's maybe two or three or 4% worse, or do we think this is an okay place to stop for now? And I think that takes us well into 2024. Deborah Cunningham of Federated Hermes, fantastic as always.
Tom, this is the conversation right now, high for longer. It's the longer piece of the high for longer phrase where there is great debate when you have a market pricing in cuts and a Federal Reserve is basically yeah. saying we're having nothing to do with it. I mentioned this in a previous hour. I mentioned it again for people just tuning in. Craig Torres and Liz Kappa McCormick out on Bloomberg over the weekend with this article. Over the last five interest rate cycles, the average hold of the peak rate was 11 months. 11 months. And when you go back to the 95 <coughs> cycle, Tom, Remember they held for five months. Yep. Peak rate is 6% and they went back to 525. And you wonder if we do get a reset, Tom. Is it a reset of recent memory well, where you go all the way back down again or is it just kind I, of an adjustment away from five back down to something like four? To the strength of their article, or one of our bond axes with the great Craig Torres of economics is nobody has a clue. No, of course I, not. I, I, I just... I, I, I think what I would say, John, is look at consensus and be very wary of it. And consensus has been that we come down with some rapidity. And I just am like, OK, maybe. We don't have a crystal ball. Okay. No one does. We, we don't. <clears throat> and my, my question really is not about where you think the economic data is going to be. It's how you think the Fed will react to it. It's a reaction function I question. Think the, the Fed is going to react on a reality that they don't look at 3.7 percent is any type of success. That's not mission accomplished. They are, they, hugely. And to me, that's the heart of the matter and the heart of our discussion on Wednesday as well. We've got Dara Mayer coming up. Good. On FX, need that. Looking forward yeah. to that. It's going to be in the studio, I'm told. Oh. From HSBC here in New York. This is Bloomberg. Again, Croatia. Croatia. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In China, COVID is rapidly spreading through households and offices after the country's pandemic rules were eased. And that's led to turmoil in poorly prepared hospitals. Some facilities are struggling to find enough staff and others are suspending non-COVID treatments. There's a sign that China and the U.S. are taking steps to ease tensions. Beijing described its meeting with U.S. diplomats that included talks on Taiwan as in-depth and constructive. The two sides met outside the Chinese capital. That was a follow-up meeting to the last month in Indonesia between President Biden and President Xi Jinping. That's led to a resumption of cooperation on several issues. Scientists in California have made a breakthrough in nuclear fusion technology. Bloomberg's learned that for the first time, they produced more energy than consumed in a reaction. It took place at the Energy Department's Lawrence Livermore Nat National Laboratory near San Francisco. While the results are considered an achievement, it's still a long way to creating a viable technology. Private equity firm Toma Bravo has agreed to buy Coupa Software for an equity value of $6.2 billion. That represents a 77% premium to the California-based company's closing price on November 22nd, prior to a Bloomberg News report on its potential sale. Toma Bravo outbid Vista Equity Partners for Coupa. Microsoft has agreed to buy a stake in the London Stock Exchange Group. The move will give the software company a 4% equity holding, which is currently valued at about $2 billion. The stake is part of a long-term agreement to help LSEG develop data analytics and cloud infrastructure using Microsoft's products. The group will spend a minimum of $2.8 billion on cloud services over the next 10 years. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. disinflation camp. Um, I think the problem is that because of the lags that are involved, it will take time to feed its way through. And the market, when I look at the shorter end of the market, it's already discounted or uh, uh, re-rated what the Fed's going to do. That was the brilliant Kathy Jones of Charles Schwab going into the Fed decision coming up on Wednesday. Before we get there, CPI coming up on Tuesday. I've said this a few times this morning. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley says yesterday's news. It's all about the earnings in the first half of 2023. And I think a lot of people on the equity side might agree. Your equity story looks like this in the equity market on the S&P and on the Nasdaq as well. We're just a little bit firmer, Tom. I pay a quarter of 1% on the S&P, up by about 11 points. It's going to be interesting. Yeah, there's a little bit of a lift here. And I'm watching the VIX carefully. It hasn't given me any love yet. It's still a, a point of tension, 24.26. It is time for Global Wall Street to lean forward for one of the great, great calls of the last number of years has been the persistency and courage of HSBC 
to say strong and resilient dollar. They amend that, sort of. So we have a sort of kind of like discussion with Dara Mayer, head of Research Americas, and the head of USFX Strategy with the great Paul Mackle as well. I, I, there's an ambivalence to your note. You're not calling for weak dollar, right? Well, we're calling for a dollar correction. It kind of amounts to the same, but it, it's not this big trend reversal. In other words, we don't undo everything that we've we've delivered uh, by virtue of dollar strength over the last 18 months or so. so Let's so talk to the, to people like John who, you know, trade off. Of, folks on the break here, John's doing FX trades here. <laughs> Can you not start rumors? <laughs> yeah, Can you I not? wouldn't want to do that. But is it a tradable come off the bloom after, uh, that's a pun there, come off the bloom, get that day bloom? Great, great guy. Nailed that. Great okay. <laughs> is it a tradable come off the bloom, or is this going to be a messy sludge where nobody really makes big figures? Look, our thought process was, we described, that we thought it'd be, this would be the chop before the flop. We'd have this really choppy period, like and then we'd, like we'd get the flop in 22. Yeah, but it, nice phraseology, but completely the wrong way around, because what we've had is the flop, and we're still kind of waiting for the chop. Okay. Um, you know, this... The reversal we've had over the last, you know, we changed our dollar view for dollar bullishness to dollar uh, choppiness and then weakness just a month ago. And in that month, we've had like one of the biggest monthly declines in the dollar. So it's really, you know, even for quote unquote a bear like us now or a newfound bear like us, it's, it's been a big old move. I, I wonder is the choppiness about to come though, you know, into the CPI, into FOMC. Um, and, and into kind of the, the beginnings of January where everybody thinks they know what the trend is for 2023 and then they're all suddenly forced to revisit in the first couple of weeks. Is there a risk that we're overplaying the one side of the currency pair? When I think about euro dollar, which got down to about 95 and then we avoided the worst case scenario coming into winter, we had that period of mild weather for the yeah. Europeans. When I think about sterling getting down to 103.50, I think intraday, the end of September, <clears> and coming back through 120, largely it was the other side of the trade. It was the sterling side, the euro side that really kicked off that move. We cleaned up the policy story in the UK. We avoided that terrible winter and the shutdowns we anticipated. Maybe they still evolve. I don't know. But do you think we're overplaying the US side of the currency pair? I would say, look, 2022 showed us that the dominant thing to get right was the dollar. I mean, we could at the margin. We had periods where this sterling was, was the swing factor, a couple of periods where euro was. But I mean, look at us this week. We have got an ECB meeting. We have got a bank meeting. We're not talking about it. Who knew? You yeah. know, um, and but but I think there's a recognition, and the reality is you've got to get the dollar right. And in a way, before you get the dollar right, you've got to get the S and P right because risk appetite has been the core of everything that's happening in the FX market and, and to the safe haven dollar. So I'm not trading rates next year. I'm trading sentiment. You're trading row, row, risk on, risk off. Right. All We're back the way. to that. All the way. Back to that. So when you think about paying some of that choppy dollar weakness through G10. What's the select currency pay you want to do that through? I think the high beta currencies on the way up in the dollar should be the high beta currencies on the way down. So your Aussie, New Zealand, your Noki Stocky, and less so the Canadian dollar. And we, we've seen that even in this dollar sell-off. You know, Canada has underperformed others. So I think you go to the, I, I mean, honestly, I'd say the Aussie perhaps and, and the Kiwi. Norway and Sweden, I know that's what you're day trading just as we came off, came on air, but, uh, you know, they're, they're for the braver man. The side. They're for the braver man, and that's why you're still having to do this gig as well. Um, <clears throat> so, I, I, yeah, I think Aussie, U.S. <sighs> dollar. <was> harsh. <laughs> <laughs> Aussie, U.S. dollar, and New Zealand, U.S. dollar, they'd, they'd be the two. Does China reopening reinforce that trade? I think it's being overplayed a little okay. bit. Why? Um, I mean, the, the transition is going to be complicated towards you know, a reopened China. Uh, perhaps the market's slightly over-egging the, the tourist angle and, and what that might mean in terms of flows. Um, but it is encouraging, and the pro-growth <coughs> stance is encouraging. But you know, look, even at HSBC, we've been looking for a rebound in China six months down the road for two years. Um, so, okay. you know, as has the market. And it's difficult because every time we think, okay, we're right. going to get fair. there, we don't fair. quite get there. Fair, And you got the leadership there with the Hong Kong position, the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation. What is the pair in the Pacific Rim to play Asia Open? I think Korea will be one. Um, it, it's KRW high beta. What? KRW, yeah. Against what? Against the dollar. I mean, I think that's... you got to go against the dollar, I think, really. I think it's the cleanest way. Okay. I mean, I think you do... <clears throat> uh, to, uh, to your question earlier, yeah. you do have to come back to a dollar view. Now, then how do you express right. it in Asia? I think Korea is, is one option. Right. Um, I guess the, the RAND is another <clears throat> high beta option. Right. Brazil is one you could like. So there's a few yeah. out there, um, okay. for sure. Mohammed from uh, Cairo in Cambridge emails in and he says, would you tell, ask Dara about Durham Kuna? I mean, I mean, if we get a Croatian-Morocco final, 
Yes. I mean, they've got all these obscure currencies. I mean, go in there. Do you have, are you like long the, I, the uh, Durham? I, do you know what? I would love to be able to give you. The, I don't know why you I would love to be able to give you the big figure in that cross, but I have no idea. But uh, as I was mentioning in the break, I am trying to dust off my family tree to see if I've got any Moroccan heritage in there so I can join in the celebrations when they beat Croatia in the final 3-0. That's been fantastic to see. You think a Croatia-Morocco final? Is that what you're looking for now? I'll, I'll, on we've always been counter-consensus at HSBC, ask, so why not? Why soccer not? guys, can I ask you a question? They play before the Sunday game, like the third, second Tuesday place and Wednesday. Game. No, but the oh, losers right. yeah, play. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's never a great game to watch. <laughs> yeah. I what are they, I mean, it's, everybody's it's like, don't hurt me, right? I don't know why they played that game. I really don't. Yeah, it's a tricky one. It's like a whole I think game, it's, like finding, it's finding the bronze medalist, isn't it? And, and also, how, really wanted? how easy was it to get tickets for this World Cup? I'd love some insight into that, because every time I watch the game, they say it's another sellout. And I'm like uh, looking, looking at in the it, stadium. I, totally with you. I, are yeah. you gaslighting me? Because I could see literally France, thousands, England was like, thousands of empty seats. France, England, I thought, was busy. Yeah. But Why do they keep of... saying it's a sellout when there's thousands of empty seats? Well, look, in England, you might think they're all down the pub. Right. But, you know, that, that could be a risk. <clears throat> um, I, right. it's, I don't know. It just, well, you can sell a ticket. It doesn't mean you have to turn up. Has Steve Major made an appearance yet? Have you I spoken mean, to Steve Major? No. I have spoken to Steve Major. I don't know if he's been out of any of the games. I think he's, he's watching from he's, Hong Kong. He's probably oh, looking oh, forward to Premier League football starts in the new year again, Tom and we can so, sort of move on with life and forget about all yeah. this. You keep bringing up this England loss, don't you? You just won't let it go. No, I'm fascinated by it. As a foreigner, I mean, I, I'm a foreigner to soccer. OK, let's okay. get let's get to the foreigner point of view. Do you think we've set the stage for a great World Cup in four years' time in North America, it in is the US and Canada and Mexico? It is superior to where we were 90 days ago. Is it a big deal? I think, yes, it will be a big deal to a new America. A younger And there's an older America. Audience. Right now, I'm focused on, is Carlos Rodon going to end up with the Red Sox? That's all. He's a, you love You're just love thinking him. about that. Okay. He's like the Mbappe. He throws only fastballs high in the strike zone. But that's a diminishing America, and it's an older America. And the new America, I think, will really embrace it. Does Fox have, does, tell, tell me Telemundo is going to do it. I'm sure they will. Yeah, I watch they on will. Telemundo. I, I, I but I was here in 94 for, for the original too, USA it was World too Cup. Early. Soccer it was too World early, Cup. Wasn't it? Well, it's too early for the US, but Ireland beat Italy. So what more? You know, okay. I'm still living off I'm that aware one. Of that. Italy living. played? Yeah, Italy played. And lost I, to I, Ireland. I, I cried, in New York. Can you imagine I cried the in that final. Atmosphere was I that cried one? in that final. I can't even remember that final. Brazil. Penalty yeah. shootout. Oh, yes, it was, wasn't it? Yeah. Roberto Baggio over the bar. I think Franco Baresi missed the penalty. I think Massaro missed the penalty. Does he remember this and yet remembers nothing about markets? Oh, <laughs> oh! Is Dara one of your friends then? Yeah, he paid me before he came on. He was one on. of mine. <laughs> you got me trying to knock his stock uh, on the side. Email and... in. Uh, seriously, <laughs> Maria Tadeo is on leave today, and uh, we, we thank her for her comments the other day. That was really a hard on leave. Point. She got a couple of days. She off. gave. I think Maria very courageously gave to a lot of the American audience, frankly global, how people really care about it. We, I, I, I will say with. Great certitude. We just don't get that. Their national identity is wrapped up in their football team. Yeah, it was particularly a great for moment. countries like Brazil. For countries <clears throat> like Brazil on the international stage, it's something they're super proud of. Mm -hmm. So for that to go the wrong way, we do okay. There. I think the I don't know if Dara's coming back. Yeah, Not, maybe I don't know. If, you know, if, if I'm around the table, maybe that won't be. Happening. Come back as Dara. your sports correspondent. I'd appreciate that, Dara. <laughs> Fantastic to catch up with you, buddy. Cheers as likewise. always, Dara Mayer. Happy holidays of HSBC to you as I well. I thought South Korea looked good. Futures up a third of one percent. You've got such a Tottenham bias to your. Mm, to your national right. team preferences. Well, they're in the finals. You think Spurs are playing on Sunday against Morocco? <laughs> oh, maybe Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> this is Bloomberg. In 2023, there's this sort of kind of limbo era where it's not really clear what's going to happen. We expect to see a lot of volatility here as we reprice earnings for next year. The indicators from the inverted yield curve to the leading indicators, I mean, I could go a long list here of things that are rolling over. Going into next year, we do think that we're going to continue to see housing weak. We're going to see goods weak. Still a chance of recession, absolutely, right? But probably at best a mild one. This is Bloomberg Survey with Tom Keane, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz.
Good, good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Bramlitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. Bramo off today. I haven't talked enough about Bramo. We'll get to that. Three-day weekend. Three-day weekend. Three day weekend. Into year-end, I told you. It. Into tomorrow, inflation. Into Wednesday, Fed Day. Yes, we'll be with you uh, Wednesday afternoon. And I'm going to get right there, John. Inflation sure. is a mystery. A CPI coming up tomorrow morning and how the Fed responds to it. Not a mystery. Another 50 basis point hike widely yeah. expected, <clears throat> anticipated on Wednesday. And then, Tom, it's your favorite piece of this. It's the dot plot for 2023. How much higher does that 23 dot go relative to the last projections we got back in September? I'd also suggest you look to the news conference as well. The last few times that Chairman Powell has spoke, I think risk management's been a <clears> big, big part of the approach, the communication. Do they think the bigger risk now, after a 50 basis point hike on Wednesday, if that's what we get, is over tightening or under tightening? Do they think yeah. the risk of doing too little still outweighs the risk of doing too much? And if that shifts, Tom, to a little bit more of a balanced view, I'd suggest that's probably a little bit more dovish than what we heard in the last I news conference. I agree with the shift idea because there is a history going back a solid 20 years that they always err on an asymmetric basis. And if you get back to symmetry of some uh, some way in decision making, that would be uh, a shift in the game in the game in the parlor game of trying to figure out the view forward. But I'm going to go back to inflation. And as Michael McKee would say, you go beneath the headline data and you've got to look at the parts of goods inflation and service inflation. And the thing I see, and we'll get to the data check in a moment, is $70 West Texas Intermediate. Oh, nice. Does that change the Fed debate? Can you imagine if they were having this meeting with a 120 oil? Seven days of losses on yeah. WTI crude. That's a big, big <clears throat> change. And Tom, to your point, there were a lot of people looking for year-end triple-digit crude. Yeah. We didn't get it. You know what the equity strategist would say this morning, Tom? Forget about it. CPI, the Fed, they've done talking about the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> they now want yeah. to talk about the consequences of this tightening cycle, 400 basis points plus, in a really short amount of time. They want to have a conversation <clears throat> about the weakness they expect in earnings to dominate this equity market in but, the first half. That's the overwhelming consensus uh, uh, view on the street into next year. I'll go there, but on Thursday or Friday, I can't remember when exactly, just the put call ratio, I think Lizanne Saunders had it out, the put, the negativity versus the call, the more optimism view, the gloom out there witnessed the put call ratio, which is maybe an antiquated number. It, the, the gloom out there is tangible. Neil Dutter of Renmac would sit in that chair and Neil would say to us, what recession? Look at the economic data. It's resilient. <clears throat> yeah. And in fact, the conversation I think he'd probably like us to have is a conversation when maybe you've got to push that further out. And what does that mean for that consensus view for how equities will perform through 2023? Yeah. I, 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 to me, it's a mystery to it. Let's get the data here and do a complete data check. I thought Darren Meyer was just brilliant there. It's brutal. What on dollar about? ambivalence. It's on the dollar edge of room, Tom. Is he allowed back? I heard from it's Steve Major of HSBC oh, months ago. You? Steve wrote in, oh. made it to one game, and he said that the atmosphere was fantastic. He said it was a lovely experience. That was the feedback. Mm -hmm. for, all the, for all the abuse this World Cup's taken going into it, Tom, he said it was a lovely experience. Futures right now up a third of 1% on the S&P. Big week of losses last week on the S&P 500, driven by the move low we saw in Friday's session. In the bond market yields, just a little bit lower, Tom. We're down three or four basis points on a 10-year, 354.33. Talked a lot about crude already. Let's finish on euro dollar, TK. 105.54. We're positive there, a tenth of 1%. To Dara's point, I actually think Dara Mayer of HSBC made a wonderful point. Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve, who's talking about the ECB coming up on Thursday. We barely mentioned it, Tom. For weeks. Well, let's go there. This is something that, that I've been hugely remiss on. Jen does a better job at this than I do. You've got Lagarde has to come out within a horrific war. We can all agree that's worse than since the last meeting. But to me, the real history is the Bank of England. The, the, the chart of the weekend was Javier Blas's electric utility chart, which was truly, folks, a moonshot of expense. Winter's arrived. Yeah. Snow's on the ground. It's getting cold. <clears throat> Strikes are kicking in over the next couple of weeks as well. So the GDP backdrop, both for Europe and the United Kingdom, the Eurozone and the UK, then the growth backdrop yeah. gets a little bit more difficult and both central banks are expected to make another move. The ECP. Tom, did you ever think the ECP would be hiking in 75 basis no. point, 50 basis point increments? Uh, Tom, there was a moment in time in the pandemic when I thought we'd go through a whole cycle again with the ECP never hiking interest rates. <clears throat> Yet here we war. are. Yeah, I, I, I go back to the war, and I think it's such a wild card that they have to tread uh, carefully. John, uh, asking for a friend. Sure. Should Americans fly to Heathrow now? Well, I'm flying into Heathrow next week. You're, yeah, but you've got – like you can get to Aberdeenshire wherever so I'm, you're going. I'm told that passport – control there will be strikes and they're getting ready to draft people in from the army is that right that's what i've read and, and we'll <clears> see <throat> if there is strikes at the 
at the border for passport control. We'll see yeah. if that, that actually materialises. Yeah. But at the moment, a difficult moment yeah. for sure. Ira Jersey to join us later in this hour with a nice Bond update from Bloomberg Intelligence. And we're thrilled moments ago we got Will Kennedy to come in on hydrocarbons and oil, 7140 American oil. Right now, Tony Rodriguez joins us, head of fixed income strategy at Naveen. Tony, I want to go to the heart of Naveen, the soul, which is municipal bonds, which is a world of their own. What does the demand for municipal bonds signal about the greater bond market? Well, good morning, Tom. Good to be with you. So, interestingly, the demand that we are seeing recover a bit in the municipal market is really reflective of something that we think is similar across not only the municipal market, but the taxable market as well. And that is a signal that we think investors are becoming significantly more comfortable with both interest rate risk, as we personally expect that we may be seeing the highs in U.S. long-term rates so far for the cycle. We're expecting lower rates at the end of 23 than where we are today. So greater comfort on that front, and also comfort around the actual credit strength and credit health of state and local governments. So we think they're in very strong condition fundamentally. And we also think that applies to the U.S. consumer balance sheet and the U.S. corporate balance sheet. So the fundamentals are actually in a fairly good spot, despite the fact that we certainly are expecting to go into a weaker economic period in 23, where we're right. thinking we're likely to see a mild recession. Well, I mean, this is something. I mean, Bramo's not here to provide re requisite gloom, but Deborah Cunningham and Tony oh, was, Rodriguez are giving us some constructive optimism. Yeah, but to Tony's point on state and local finances, uh, Tony, I don't hear it talked about enough, I don't think. Th these guys have got a lot of cash, haven't they? Can you walk us through just how strong that financial position is? So, Jonathan, as you know, through a lot of the fiscal stimulus, there were direct payments made to state and local governments, as there were to U.S. consumers. And that certainly helped to ease some of the debt burden and any of the liquidity squeeze that we might typically see in a slowdown period. So, as a result, the need for, say, the consumer or state and local governments to retrench in the face of slowing economic growth, high energy prices, et cetera, is a bit reduced. It's a result of that that we think not that we will avoid necessarily slow down, mild recession, but that th that will help underpin a milder, shorter recession as a result of that fundamental credit and balance sheet strength that we see relative to previous periods entering slowdowns. Tony, that's the shallow of short and shallow. You've helped us understand the shallow piece of it. Can you help us understand the short piece of it? Why do people think that if we do get a downturn, it will be short. It won't be for very long. Why is that? Yeah, Jonathan, I think the main reasons there are, again, when we think about the Federal Reserve pausing, as we suspect it will be after their final increase in March, but certainly at the latest, one more increase at their May meeting. So it is that pause that we expect to see from the Fed that allows, we think, the economy to kind of reset digest that higher level of rates, see the slowdown occur right. in the housing sector, and really build the baseline for a recovery in 24, which, by the way, Jonathan, our forecast would be for about 1.5% growth. So it's certainly not a strong recovery. It's just a return to mm -hmm. really below average growth. Tony, with all the heritage of Nuveen, we've had an historic drop in bond price this year, blended, whatever number you want to take. How many years does it take to claw back? Are you looking at a three-year horizon to get back? You know, Tom, I think it's more likely to be closer to a two-year horizon. Because okay. I do think we'll get a bit of a tailwind from lower rates. But you bring up a good point that despite the fact that in the equity markets we've seen, maybe we'll call it a run-of-the-mill bear market at around 20%. We've seen the worst bear market in bonds in over 40 years. So a lot of the damage has really been around kind of higher quality, longer duration assets in this particular market downturn. Tony, just a final word on the Fed on Wednesday. I want to squeeze this in. Tom and I have been talking about it. He has no interest in the dot plot, never has done. But I think a lot of other people do. Tony, where is there scope for surprise when everyone expects the Fed to maybe push 23 out to a five handle? Well, I think you make a good point, Jonathan. I don't think the scope for surprise is in the dot plot. I think the scope for surprise at this meeting will be in the press conference and how hawkish uh, 
Chairman Powell decides to be, given that he was interpreted as being fairly dovish coming out of the Brookings interview, I think you'll see a pushback. I think that could be a bit more hawkish than what the market's currently expecting. Tony, wonderful to hear from you, as always. Tony Rodriguez there of Nuveen. How many times, TK, have we heard short and shallow? Short and shallow? Uh, I don't. Short and shallow? If the Fed's going to push back against this interest rate cutting stuff... Does that downturn get a little bit more prolonged because they won't respond to it? I had this conversation this weekend. Part of watching financial media is to grasp where consensus is. I, I Agreed. Mean, if you're in the game, you got to know where consensus is. And I think we try to deliver that every day. And yes, you know, f- beyond transitory, it became short and shallow in gaming it. There's no research whatsoever that you can game a recession. None. Zero. The consensus for next year is driving you nuts, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's just a little just bit too game. cute. I'm with I, you. It's just, way too you know, cute. We've been talking I, about it for, for a number of months now. You know, I, I look at the work of Martin Feldstein and what James Perturba at MIT did here with NBER, and the answer is this is complex stuff. And we all speak with certitude. You know, we believe. First well, half, first equities half. down. Second yes. half, equities up. And here's our outlook page. 55 pages. 4K year-end, <clears> which is where we are basically right now. On the equity market, futures positive, a third of 1%. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. A man charged in the 1988 Lockerbie bombing of a Boeing 747 that killed 270 people is in U.S. custody. He's been identified as a former Libyan intelligence officer. The U.S. calls a suspect a third conspirator in the attack, saying he helped build the bomb that destroyed Pan Am Flight 103 over Scotland. Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz will host a virtual meeting of the Group of Seven leaders today to discuss Ukraine's immediate needs. That's following Russian missile attacks on the country's energy infrastructure. Meanwhile, President Biden spoke to Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky. The White House says the president affirmed the U.S. commitment to keep providing military and economic aid. In the U.K., the government is planning for military staff and civil servants to cover for striking rail, health, postal and other workers. Strikers are planned for almost every day through the rest of the month. Workers are demanding pay hikes that keep up with inflation. It's the biggest wave of industrial strife in the U.K. since the 1980s. It's Amgen's biggest acquisition ever. The biotech giant has agreed to buy Horizon Therapeutics for $27.8 billion. That represents a 48% premium since a developer of autoimmune disease treatments disclosed it was in talks with three potential buyers. Both Sanofi and Johnson & Johnson unit dropped out of the running. And Rivian has scrapped plans to make electric vans in Europe with Mercedes. The agreement was just signed three months ago. Rivian says it will focus on its own consumer and commercial vehicles. It has been a tough first year of production for the company. Rivian lowered its full year output goal and then had to recall almost all the vehicles it had built for a minor defect. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. The long-term structural imbalance between supply and demand globally uh, is not going away. And yes, we have, for the moment, dodged a bullet with regard to the start of winter and the Ukraine war. But we're not addressing the long-term issues of bringing more infrastructure to sate uh, growing demand. The narrative has shifted to a point now where it's moved away from supply, which has been the the real uh, uh, bullish driver. And now it's a demand picture. Stephen Shulk, their principal at the Shulk Group, in the last hour. On Bloomberg Surveillance. Thank you for being with us live from New York. Let's get you some price action quickly in the equity market on the S&P and the Nasdaq pushing just a little bit higher by a third of 1%. On both of those in the bond market yields are lower by three or four basis points. 353.97 euro dollar into the ECB on Thursday for the one <coughs> side of the trade into the Federal Reserve on Wednesday for the other. Euro dollar 105.63. And to finish on crude, just a turnaround here in the last, I would say 20 minutes or so. Crude now positive by three quarters of 1% briefly on a seven-day losing streak. Looking to snap that now with WTI crude at 71.50, Tom. The lower the session, 
$70.25 yeah. became very close to the 60s a little bit earlier. And we are very fortunate to have with us now Will Kennedy for any number of reasons. We've got eight ways to go here, John, but let's do it with Will Kennedy running all of our hydrocarbon coverage out of London. Kennedy making every penalty shot he did in his ute in uh, uh, school joins us. Will Kennedy, let me go to the, the society of it, the public of it as well. Between cold weather and strikes... How frozen is the London and the United Kingdom economy now? Is it something you're writing about of crisis or is it just partly December? I think people are just going to start Christmas early. They're going to stay at home for the next 10 days. Uh, obviously work very hard from home and then, you know, just get through the <coughs> Christmas period. Yes, it's very hard to move around London right now. It's very hard to move around the UK. Uh, a lot of people are meant to be having Christmas parties uh, this week and that's not happening in many cases. So there will be an yeah. economic hit. So time for a bit of hibernation, I think. Oh, it sounds good. Will, will Kennedy, Javier Blas writing today about something I've really focused on, which is we have all this fancy Bloomberg surveillance talk with a war going on. After the war, can we repair a European relationship with Russia? Well, Javier thinks that it's likely. He thinks that economics and proximity mean that the gas will flow eventually. I'm a little less sure, perhaps. I think a lot of people would point to the political unity, to the, to the feeling that, um, you know, it would be impossible to do uh, business with Putin again. I think most people's view would be that as long as Putin's in the Kremlin, it'll be very hard to resurrect that gas bridge. Um, and, but that means some tough times ahead for Europe. Uh, I think as we go into next year, what's abundantly clear is that a lot of people thought this might be a short-term crisis, uh, but 2023 looks pretty tough on the energy front as well. So those political pressures that Javier described are not going to go away anytime soon. Well, the Europeans are talking about a multi-winter crisis, Will. Could you help us understand how the Europeans will achieve next winter what they achieved this winter. How do they get storage capacity, get capacity up to where they want it to be, get storage up to where they want it to be, without Nord Stream available to them next year, Will? How's this going to work? It's going to be tough. Uh, clearly, paying top dollar for LNG supplies is going to be a big part of the picture. And, of course, Germany will have the ability to import LNG in a way that it didn't in 2022 with new terminals opening up in the north of the country. But that will be incredibly expensive and, of course, have knock-on effects through the rest of the world. Uh, demand destruction is clearly part of a picture. I mean, I think one of the, there's a lot of focus on storage, but one of the reasons why we're getting through this winter, albeit at a big cost, uh, is that uh, we're just using less gas and a lot of industry has worked out how to use less gas. Um, and slowly and at the margin, investment in other forms of energy, particularly solar and wind, uh, and I know that there are problems with intermittency on some days, will start to fill some of that supply gap for electricity. Well, when people ask you about China reopening, what do you tell them about how it might potentially complicate the flow of energy around the world? Well, you know, what's sort of slightly mystifying about the recent uh, price action in crude that you described at the beginning, you know, this really big slide we've seen, is that this end of COVID zero should, on the face of it, be quite bullish uh, for China. It will eventually mean people driving more, flying more, and it's the last piece of pandemic lost demand to be refilled. Uh, and it looks like that's going to happen in early 2023. But it's not happening quite yet, and I think <clears throat> there are a few reasons for that, one of which may be that, you know, the road to COVID zero could be very bumpy indeed, um, and it's a bit early as you consider your positions at the end of the year to take a position on what it means. So you're reporting as China will not open up to the end of the year? No, no, I don't think that's the point. I don't think that's the point that I'm making. Clearly, uh, COVID zero is is happening. The end of COVID zero is happening. But if many people get ill in the interim, that's not necessarily good. Uh, for the immediate prospects for the economy. It could be a bumpy <clears throat> ride before we reach, China reaches the point that the US and Europe has reached uh, towards the end of the pandemic. Hey, I, I look, Will, at where we are sort of year end in and what we're, you know, sitting on our desk, we had a lot of people with higher oil prices. The demand did not materialize. And we focus on Ed Morse here of Citigroup, who, who is really brilliant. 
about a call to the 70s. Is anyone framing out a persistency of under, say, $73 Brent crude of West Texas Intermediate under $69, $68? I mean, a lot of people are cutting their predictions right now. Um, yeah. A lot of people are less bullish than they were. And I think it's not so much <coughs> the demand side. I think what has probably surprised people is the supply side. And obviously, the big event in the oil market was the introduction of uh, European sanctions on Russian crude at the, on December the 5th, earlier this month. And I think one of the things we're seeing now is that that event <coughs> did not have the impact on the market that many people expected. Right now, the flow of Russian crude is being reordered but it's still happening. It's going to Asia. China's buying. India's buying. Russian production remains high. And I think that's probably one thing that a lot of people got wrong about the market. They expected big constraints in the flow of Russian crude, and they haven't happened. And I think that's changed the balances. And it's perhaps one reason why prices have, uh, have remained very subdued. But what one thing that we don't know is what the Russian response will ultimately be we had those comments from Putin at the end of last week in that when he teased that he might consider cutting production as a retaliation. We'll have to see what happens there. Well, Kennedy, well, wonderful as always to catch up with you and the whole of your team over in London <coughs> on crude. It's been amazing to see crude gap lower in the way it has done, Tom. Bit of a yeah. bounce this morning, up 1% now on WTI, but the previous six days, lower, 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 I, lower, lower. It, just a, it is the shock of the year. There's no question about that. And there's other things. Curve inversion, I think, we're there now, negative 80 basis points as well. The, you know, we don't have Maria with us today. She's still in uh, uh, treatment for uh, the Spain loss, but... You know, I, I read the articles in the media, including Bloomberg, Kevin Whitelaw writing it up for Bloomberg, on bags of cash. And you have alluded to this over the years. And we're trying to do it, folks, in a journalistically responsible OK, let's, way. let's see how this goes in the next but, 60 seconds. But they've they the European Parliament and one of their leaders, a vice president, Kylie Carly. of Greece. Yeah. Do, you, do you know her? Like, she's she visible? From about maybe seven or eight years ago when I was in London, sure, through the Greek crisis. These articles don't mince words. Bags of cash. So let's be really specific. Yeah. Arrested in an investigation into a suspected bribery by a Gulf state. That Gulf state hasn't been named. People suspect it's Qatar. A Qatari spokesperson said he was unaware of any investigation, denied misconduct, as you might expect the line to be. What's happened as a consequence, I understand, Tom, this, this lawmaker, Eva Kali has been suspended by the Parliament's wow. Socialist and Democrats group and expound from the Greek centre-left PASOK party as well. What they found was <clears throat> cash worth about €600,000, Tom, seized by Belgian police in 16 searches in Brussels on Friday. So, I mean, I don't have the clarity either or the detail. Yeah, I don't think uh, we do. And this is all I've got so okay. far. So this story's been pieced together piece by piece over the last so couple much of days. World Cup glow. You know, well, I mean, it depends it who it involves, right? We haven't got confirmation of that. That's true. We From do. New York, Futures Up. This is Bloomberg. Sixty minutes away from the opening bell, equity futures on the S and P on the Nasdaq slightly elevated, up a third of one percent here on the S and P five hundred. Happy Monday. Yields are lower by three basis points on a ten-year three fifty-four. If there's a turnaround so far in this market, it's come in the commodity market for crude because yeah. crude was lower for a seventh session. It's now higher by seven tenths mm -hmm. of one percent. Tom, seventy-one dollars and about fifty cents. Yeah. Big weekly loss I, I'm on glad crude you, this I'm week. I'm glad you bring it Biggest up. Biggest weekly I'm, loss since April last week. I, I'm looking at red zone, green zone on, on the Bloomberg Commodity Index. And going back to September, and frankly, you can even talk it up back to July, it's sort of been up, down, up, down, up, down, and now it's bouncing off the bottom. Like you say, it's been a little bit of a commodity lift. Just intriguing to see it in the China? low 70s as China reopens. Are they reopening? Of... That's the question. To hear the chief medical advisor of China <clears throat> compare Omicron to the flu... I would say, Tom, they're on their is, way. It's a bit of a turn Science from there. the Chinese in the last couple of weeks. That's for sure. Well, there's no question uh, about that. The other thing we're looking at, of course, is the inflation report tomorrow, and I think the slice and dice that John is 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 tangible. This is not just one report. Powell Wednesday will probably feature other inflation series besides what we see tomorrow. Well, it's intriguing, Tom, because he said there was no space for nuance. <clears throat> at the last news conference, and then at Brookings he used a lot of nuance and yeah. started chopping and dicing mm. it three different ways, services, ex-shelter. So we'll see what kind of power yeah. we get 
Do we get the Brookings Powell at this news conference? The on the one hand this, the other hand that. Well, ton of academia, a, all that kind of stuff. He doesn't kick the ball over the crossbar. Oh, another yeah. dig at Harry. Nice. Yeah. Is that how you welcome our next guest? It is. You know, they don't. They, they score their penalty kicks at Newcastle. Ian, welcome to New York Ian from from England and <clears throat> Shepherdson, sure. your chief economist at Pantheon <laughs> Macri. So we'll get to the soccer talk in a in, in a bit. What is the distinction? What is the nuance of tomorrow's inflation report, or for that matter, the reports plural of the coming days and weeks? We're going to see something that looks a lot more like the last one than the two before that. So Powell's been very clear that one good CPI report, one good anything report isn't going to change his mind. We've got to see a sequence. If you look back over the last couple of years, we've had good numbers that got everyone excited. And then the next month, we get blindsided by a rebound. And that's happened over and over again. So we've got to see a sequence of decent numbers. Kind of no matter what comes out tomorrow, they're going to do 50 basis points. Uh, at the meeting this week, it's really what it what matters over the next two or three reports, building up a picture by the end of the first quarter where we may be sitting on maybe three or four good reports. And at that point, the Fed's in a very different place. Your voice sounds like Alan Greenspan late in his career here. Can you tell us about Harry and the Shepherdson voice? Is this like a weekend effect? Uh, it may be connected. It there may was be a lot connected. of shouting over the weekend. There's a little bit of, course, a lot of shouting. My, my voice survived <clears throat> yeah. Saturday. That was, yeah. that was brutal. And, and I, I heard a TV remote was remoted. <laughs> the batteries might have come out and exploded against the wall, but, you know, these things happen. These things happen, you know. <laughs> <Inevitable. Okay. laughs> Let's continue, and if you can't talk, we'll do sign language here. Let's like the dots. What are we going to see in the dots? Is that the sign language of the Fed meeting? We're going to see more dots, but, you know... Uh, <laughs> The dots are a lot less important than they used to be. They're data contingent. Everybody is a slave to the data. The Fed, the markets, everyone. So, uh, yeah, the dots are going to rise. Uh, they'll probably add in one or two more hikes for 23, so possibly a five handle. But, of course, you know, if the next two, three payroll reports are weak and the next two, three core CPI reports are weak, then the game changes no matter what the dots say. In early this year, and I remember the report, read through the report, you said that by the time we get to September, the slowdown in this economy will be so obvious, this Fed would have to back away. What surprised you about how things actually turned out? Was it the fact that the economy hold up, held up or the fact that the Federal Reserve has tolerated the weakness that you've identified? It was a bit of everything. I think they haven't put as much emphasis on the weakness of the housing market as I thought they would, because housing's in, in total meltdown and they've been very resistant to buy into the idea that that's symptomatic of any broad sort of weakening. Plus, we've seen a, a, a more sustained increase in rents, which is a big chunk of the core CPI. It's now rolling over, or beginning to roll over, but as of now, the last few prints have been quite big. And the margin expansion, which has driven up inflation more broadly, although it is clearly now beginning to reverse on the back of this improving supply story, it's been a bit more persistent than I hoped it would be. So it's kind of a two or three things around the edges. But looking forward into next year, I, I think it's very dangerous to assume that what's happened over the last few months happens again over the next few months. There's a lot more signs now of a pretty clear inflection point in both the growth and the inflation numbers. So, for example, we're starting to see a pickup in layoffs now, which we just haven't seen at all. Started in tech, now it's broadening out, at the same time that we're seeing indicators of slower hiring as well. So the payroll picture, which has been great, looking into next year looks a lot more softening coming through in the, in the first few months. With all that in mind, how high do you think the bar is to cut rates? Well, the bar to cut rates is, is about the labour market, the inflation numbers and wages. We're not going to get rate cuts until all three of those things have, are materially different from where we are now. So, yeah, they can, they can slow down the rate hikes already because of what's happening on the inflation side, but they can't cut until the labour market has really eased substantially. Wage growth at 5% or thereabouts no way are they cutting rates because there's no one at the Fed who could plausibly argue that's consistent with 2% inflation. So that's the final piece of the jigsaw. It'll be the last piece to change, but I think it might change a bit quicker than markets expect. So where do we settle if we're going to become unanchored, if we're not going to get to 2%, I'm not predicting that, but if that's the reality, what's the level of inflation, which is not your new 2%, but where they have to make some really difficult theoretical decisions? Yeah, so this is a very difficult debate for them to have while you're above the target. Uh, saying anything other Fair. than you're going to get it back to the target is, is impossible. But there is, of course, a, a body of opinion. I'm not sure I'm, I'm with it, but there is a body of opinion that says structural forces, geopolitics mean that returning <coughs> to those two or less that we were seeing consistently before COVID will be very difficult, at which point the Fed will have to have a, a serious conversation about whether the 2% target is still appropriate. But they can't do that while they are fighting to rebuild their credibility after the transitory fiasco. 
They, they haven't is, done that yet with no. his effort at Jackson Hole. What was it, yeah. an eight-minute speech? Eight minutes, yeah. direct, pretty yeah. blunt, straightforward. Jackson Hole and beyond has not repaired the transitory challenges. Not yet. I mean, inflation is still too high. I mean, there's no way around this. Of course it yeah. is. It's not their fault, though. I no. mean, we had a pandemic. It's not It's not their fault, but it was the, they, the way that they dressed it up as being mm. transitory. I can't. If they defined transitory as 18 months, we wouldn't have had any problem, but they didn't. So there is still a, a battle to regain credibility. And while you're fighting to regain credibility, you can't even hint of a hint that you wish the target was a bit higher. But they might have to down the line. Twelve months ago, when the Fed came out for forecasts, with forecasts for the following 12 <clears> months, they had Fed funds at 90 basis points to end 2022. We're going to end closer to 5%. With that in mind, how much should we pay attention to the projections that come out on Wednesday? This is something that frustrates Tom a lot and others too. How much attention should we, how much weight should we put on those projections? Well, if you're trading fixed income on the day of the meeting... It's all you care about. Sure. But if you're thinking about where the Fed is actually going to be six months or 12 months from now, you need to take your own view on where you think the data are going to go. Because they can say whatever they like, they can put whatever dots they like into the plot, but they'll do what the data tell them to do ultimately. So the decision for this week is baked in. But immediately after that, when we're looking at February 1 for the next decision, between now and then, we've got CPI reports, <coughs> PPI reports, payroll data, wages data, everything. And, and those things can begin to move them away from the dots immediately. Because the fact is, we don't know. We're in, uh, this is why Powell keeps telling everyone we have to be humble, we have to be nimble, we have to be data dependent. The days when you can sit in the middle of an economic cycle and say, yeah, tomorrow's just going to be like today, it's fine, we know it's going to happen, <clears throat> that's not where we are. So when you think about the dots, and this is hard to get a Fed official to really be transparent about this if they did indeed think the following way, do you think those dots are to signal where they want to tell people where they think they'll be to get financial conditions to tighten now? Or is it actually a best guess of where they think they'll be? Yeah. Well, because there's a difference there, there isn't a difference. there? And there's a bit of both, depending on the, on the circumstances, depending on what markets are saying. If markets are, are not where they want them to be, then it becomes a game of, of psychology. Uh, and I can, I can understand that because the last thing they want is to find financial conditions running ahead of where they want them to be, which means that they might then not be able to do what they oh. think they're going to be able to do. It's, it's, it's very much a, a catch-22 for, for policymakers because markets are so attuned to every little change of nuance that they, or perceived change of nuance that the Fed can find itself generating outcomes that it didn't really want just through the way it communicates. But, uh, I, I'm going to bring this up, and it's, it's good of you to bring it up today. The Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, the Chicago Index, the Goldman Sachs Index, they're all running against Powell. Mm. I don't understand yeah. how he can act to save face until he gets a restrictive summation of financial conditions. We're nowhere near that. Well, I mean, the only thing you can control directly is rates. Uh, and uh, to some extent, short-term expectations of rates and everything else is much more difficult, which is why he's maintained the hawkish talk, though, of course, there was that, that shift at the Brookings speech unquestionably, which I guess was because perhaps we're beginning to see some fracturing within the views on the, on the committee as well and the change in the language in the statement, the talk about lags <coughs> and the cumulative impact. Yeah. That's, a, that's a real change. So he's got to hold everything together, which is not necessarily straightforward. I found it odd that people didn't think there was a shift at Brookings when... There clearly was there in was. the way he communicated. I there was the same way too. He's been a blank wall until Brookings, uh, and, and and it wasn't that it was a massive shift. It was just the fact it was that the it was nuance. a shift. And there, and was, there was some yeah. emphasis on the risk of over tightening, and I hadn't heard that in the news no, conference. No, we, ha we hadn't. You know, he'd been pretty much a, a straight arrow in the previous press conference. Your voice has to heal. I mean, I guess you're going to do that because you've got Morocco, Croatia in your bracket. But uh, can I ask a question? What happens to the Premier League after this big event? John, you've said this is highly unusual. Is it just back to normal the next day? My biggest complaint about this World Cup has been the schedule, that the players have had to play a really condensed fixture list ahead of the World Cup, and they'll have to do it after the World Cup as yeah. well. And we've seen injuries, and I don't, think it's, I don't think it's just by accident that we're seeing these injuries start to pile up for some of these big players now who are going to be out. Well, this is why nobody wanted it in the winter anyway. Not good. It was, uh, but, you know. So you're going to come back in January, basically, to ask your, answer your question, Tom. You're going to come back, you're going to have a lot of football to play for the big clubs. Which a lot players of did so well in the World Cup, they redo their compensation value? Who's worth more now because they did so well in the World Cup? For England. Well, no, uh, other teams too. I think know. Jude Bellingham's Italy, transfer uh, value is just Be Bellingham's Sweden. has probably put a zero on the end of his Just, of, just of his gone price. up again. Uh, now kind of raise the question of how many clubs could afford him. I know. 
Uh, and the, not many is the answer. Now maybe Man City. Mm -hmm. I think Liverpool in the mix for him too, right? From what I hear, From, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. What about AC Milan guy? He looked like a genius at the end of the game. Giroud. He's like 45 Revitalized. years old, and he was like, "Yeah, we we'll look after our players in Milan. We we'll look after our players." It was very cool. This I was mean, very even cool. I could tell he was. Who do you support now, Ian? What happens? Who do you support? Well, for the for the World Cup. For the World Cup. Oh, I'm, my my interest is gone. Just indifferent. Now. One, World one, Cup one, finished one, on one, Saturday. When that okay. ball went over the bar, that was it. I just switched off. <laughs> so the World Cup in Qatar oh, yeah. finished. Out, out of the channel in England. England. Yeah, for your voice, I recommend Tang. I tank? Like Do you have hot tank, tank Tom, in the winter? Hot tang is hot tank. Thank you. Thank you. A little squeeze of lemon in Ian, this was fantastic, sir, yeah. as always. Yeah, you're right. Rest up. I hope the wrist gets better, too. <clears throat> Ian smashed the TV. Do you see that? It's got did. a cast on. It's got plaster on from smashing up the TV. Ian Shepardson and Pantheon Mako. <laughs> I'm told it was actually a football accident. Futures up on the S&P by a third of 1%. Coming up, Dan Suzuki of Richard Bernstein, Seema Shah of Principal Asset Management, Aaron Cannon of Clear Harbour Asset Management, all in the next hour on Bloomberg TV. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In China, COVID is rapidly spreading through households and offices after the country's pandemic rules were eased. That's led to turmoil in poorly prepared hospitals. Some facilities are struggling to find enough staff and others are suspending non-COVID treatments. An investigation into alleged bribery involving European Parliament lawmakers is growing. Four people, one of them a lawmaker, were charged with corruption and money laundering. Police seized close to $800,000. Two countries, Qatar and Morocco, were cited in some of those legal documents. In Peru, protesters battled police, leaving at least one person dead. President Dina Bolarte declared a state of emergency in several areas. She also plans to ask that the general election be held early. Peru was thrown into chaos last week when President Pedro Castillo was impeached and then arrested after trying to dissolve Congress. Private equity firm Toma Bravo has agreed to buy Coupa Software for an equity value of $6.2 billion. And that represents a 77% premium to the California-based company's closing price on November 22nd, prior to a Bloomberg News report on its potential sale. Toma Bravo outbid Visa Equity Partners for Coupa. Microsoft has agreed to buy a stake in the London Stock Exchange Group. The move will give the software company a 4% equity holding, which is currently valued at about $2 billion. The stake is part of a long-term agreement to help LSEG develop data analytics and cloud infrastructure using Microsoft's products. The group will spend about a minimum of $2.8 billion on cloud services over the next 10 years. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. These figures confirm that this is a very challenging economic situation here and across the world. And it will get worse before it gets better. But we have a plan that will more than halve inflation over the next year. And if we stay the course, we can get back to the strong economic growth that we need. The crash and then the Chancellor of the Exchequer there, of course, the BOE meeting coming up later this week. That was Jeremy Hunt. I believe that was taped and filmed before the loss of England. We'll have to see if he has a different tone uh, right now. This is a joy. We will get to the World Cup. We do so with the person I know more committed to American soccer Anyone in my universe, that is Ira Jersey, is chief U.S. interest rate strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. And the trap here, Ira, is we got a glorious 10 minutes with you and spent too much of it on World Cup chat where people <laughs> really want to know is head of our U.S. interest rate strategy, what you think about uh, the view forward. Which duration is your biggest mystery into next year? So, so I really... I'm worried about the the belly of the curve. Like, what happens with the five year and the seven year? I'm, part I'm of worried. The curve? I go go wide here, as they say, Matt in TV. I'm worried about the belly of the curve as well. Continue. So, so, so be, because there there is a lot of uncertainty about what the future path of interest rates is. So, I think what what that means is, yes, you might have two year yields that stay in the you know four and a quarter, four and a half percent range as the Fed maintains its policy. But there's a there's significant questions as to when they're going to cut. 
So um, Anna Wong with Bloomberg Economics, myself and a lot of others think that they're going to remain on hold for all of 2023, maybe into 2024 until it's very clear. And you just heard Ian Shepardson mentioned right. that the three <clears throat> big things that need to change in order for the Fed to cut interest rates. And, and those things might not change until 2024, maybe even beyond. So because of that, that the five year is going to go up and down along the yield curve based on uh, changing expectations of, are they going to cut in, in 2023? Are they not going to cut until right. 2025? And that's going to change the expectations that are embedded in that belly of the Treasury. So two, two, condi- two questions here. One of them has to do with the curve moving from the vanilla curve from two-year out to 10-year as well. Ian Lingen, among others, at BMO Capital Markets, looks for truly historic mm-hmm. inversion out to negative 100 basis points as well. What's the ramifications to our viewers and listeners with a beyond Volcker curve inversion? So so during the Volcker era, we actually got to negative 200 basis points on the two-year, 10-year curve. For a cup of curve. coffee. For a cup yeah, of coffee, yeah. but it stayed for nine months between negative 100 and negative 150. Interesting. Uh, I, I, don't, I think that that's a reasonable expectation during this environment, too. So our, our target is now about a uh, 150 basis point inversion at some point. Um, it probably is there for, like you with said, the a cup same of coffee. Volcker like duration? Uh, well, so, so durations are still uh, are significantly longer, actually. But but will it stay there for nine months, you mean? Yes. Um, yeah, it, it, I think that, that a, an inverted curve is going to be a fixture for 2023. I think we hit that peak inversion sometime right around the time that okay. the Fed finishes uh, raising <clears throat> interest rates. And then after that, we actually start to, uh, to, to what we call bull steepen. So two-year yields wind up going down in. Um, and uh, b- because we wind up pricing in cuts at some point in the future. Um, it's the strength of that uh, of that rally in the front end of the curve that I think is is very suspect because w- I, our view is that we're going to wind up with policy rates with the overnight interest rate staying five percent right. for a long time. So that's going to make it difficult for two years to rally very quickly. But they, they probably okay. will rally a bit. Forget about bond guys trading spreads from the belly of the curve out to vanilla twos tens or even something out like three months thirty year blah blah blah. What's it mean for mere mortals? To have a curve inversion like the late 70s, early 80s, a double recession in the early 80s, but it's not the early 80s, is it? So what's it going to mean? Well, I, so, so what does it mean? It means that it's hard actually to make money and in, in carry and roll down. So one of the ways that when the yield curve is steeper that you that you make money in fixed income is you'll buy like a 10-year bond that becomes a seven-year bond eventually. And and the price actually will wind up staying relatively constant or, or even rise right, right. because interest rates fall over time. Um, th- now, that's not going to be the case now. It's actually just the opposite uh, where you actually roll up the yield curve. So, so so one of the challenges w- with that right now is that it's – it's um, or, or one of the good things, I should say, it's easy to own 10-year bond yields because if you buy the 10-year now in the not-too-distant future, um, the, the, the price of that bond might actually go up. Um, which, which is a, a, a kind of an oddity, just because of the shape of the curve. Um, I, I think, generally speaking, what does it mean for like the the overall economy? It's actually good, right? Because most Thank funding you. is much different today than it was right. prior to the global financial crisis. So one of the ironies is is that we have five <clears throat> and ten year uh, bond yields that are that are lower than short term, and you know it's not going to affect the financial mm-hmm. sector in the same way that it has in the past. What you just heard there, folks, is the single most important thing you'll. Here this week on Bloomberg Surveillance and our Fed meeting. Let's dive into this further. Ira Jersey on why curve inversion is quote unquote good for the economy because it's not like the late 70s, early 80s. Yeah. So, so if you think about it, if you if you uh, uh, you know buy a car, for example, you know that's usually a say a three to five year loan. Yes, three year interest rates are high, but five year interest rates vis a vis short term interest rates aren't very high, right? So you do have an inverted curve just about everywhere. And then if you're a corporation borrowing money, yes, interest rates are higher. We still have three and a half percent ten year Treasury yields, and then you add on to that another hundred or hundred and fifty basis points for for credit spread, you're talking about 5% yields, which is much higher than it was not long ago. But I'd rather 
borrow 5% 10 year yields than I than I would necessarily 6% uh, two year. So this inversion isn't having a, as detrimental of effect. You, you were talking about financial conditions. Mm -hmm. One of the effects of an inverted yield curve is that financial conditions aren't as tight as they might be otherwise um, in, in real terms, right? So and I think some of the financial um, indicators, that, um, the, the financial conditions indicators kind of don't get that wrong. And, and um, so, you know, we're going to actually be digging in over the next couple of weeks into the financial conditions indexes uh, that we have here at Bloomberg in order to kind of ascertain, hey, not only what's driving it, because we know what's driving it, right? It's the stock market going up is what's really making um, the financial conditions a bit easier. Right. But it's a green span. It, yeah. Say. But but what's going on in, in the, the credit markets winds up being, you know, I think it, from on a going forward basis, super important. Because if you see credit spreads tighten a lot, that creates more of a problem for the Fed. That just means that the right. Fed has They're to— They're more accommodative. Bramo's yeah. been talking right. about this yep. like crazy. The spreads haven't moved. That, that's mm -hmm. right. Spreads are the same. And now <clears throat> right. that you've had a you know 75 base point rally yeah. in 10-year yields, that's actually right. made financial conditions much easier. Rutherford, uh, excuse me. MetLife Stadium, 2026, <laughs> finals of the World Cup. As John Farrow asked an hour and a half ago, will America embrace the World Cup? I think so. You know, so I, I actually was in England during the 1994 World Cup doing my postgraduate work. And what, coming back from England at the time, all of a sudden people were talking about soccer, which had never happened before mm -hmm. in my lifetime. Um, and, you know, now now I think 2026 could be another impetus to grow the sport even more in the United States, where it is going to be on, you know, everyone's billboards. It's going to be in all the major metropolitan areas in the country. And, uh, you know, where we are here in, you know, New York, New Jersey, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, it's going to be great because we have right. games at MetLife as well as games down at Lincoln Financial Field in Philadelphia. So we're going to have a lot of great soccer here right. in, in our area. France, Argentina, your wisdom. I mean, you're out. What is the age group you you're in, in Central Jersey? You're doing what? So I so I coach uh, I, I coach an adult team right now. So oh, you're coaching had, an had, adult team right uh, yeah, now. Yeah, we had a big three one win last night to finish our fall uh, fall season. Okay, and uh, we we go into the spring on a, on a high. Who yeah. looks more adult, France or Argentina? <laughs> well, definitely Argentina, but uh, you know both teams have a lot of depth, and I I think you know France with guys like Kylian Mbappe and you know Olivier Giroud, you know the man with the the greatest hair and in soccer and world sports, probably he looks. Yeah, yeah. I said, you know, yeah, I thought Farrell could, you know. Do that <laughs> sure, I, I, you know, those two teams are, are really good. I mean, it's amazing though the underdog story here, right? This World Cup with Morocco and and Croatia in the, uh, um, you know, in the semifinals is. It, it would be great to see one of them in it. I mean, I, I always root for the underdog in in <clears throat> matches like those. So right. it'll be. Uh, so, so I'll be wearing well, my, uh, my my red and white stripes. Okay, we'll have to see yeah. the Friday before the festivities. I believe it's Sunday the 18th is the finals. We'll be sure to get Ira Jersey in here uh, with appropriate uh, wisdom. Let me give you wisdom on a data check on a Monday before a crucial Tuesday, a crucial Wednesday. I think the world stops Wednesday at 2.30. We migrate forward. Futures uh, futures up nine. They've advanced nicely through the day. Butter stopped at that 4,000 level John was talking about earlier. Dow futures up 60 points, 33,000. 800 on the dollar. VIX goes the wrong way, 24.36. We'll get a good set on this here in 35 minutes to Ira Jersey's point curve inversion. I'm still not used to negative 80 basis points, which shows substantial inversion. Jersey suggesting we could get more inversion along the way. And Sterling for Will Kennedy. Thank you for being with us, Will, from London. 123, rounded up, 123. Strong Sterling uh, today. Please stay with us through the day on Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. Good morning.